You are listening to Changed Mate, Cyber Mate Series, Book 4, written by Candace Ayers, narrated by Maeve York. Chapter 1. Mariah I pushed open the door to Jammy's salon, and as soon as Jammy's eyes landed on me, she dropped the comb in her hand and hurried over with outstretched arms. Her hot pink hair was twisted into a knot atop her head, and the ends stuck out in all directions like a fan. Kitty, your niece is here, Jammy called over her shoulder as she pulled me into a tight hug. You look so good, sweetheart. I wasn't a huge hugger, but I feebly attempted to hug Jammy back as best I could. Fortunately, I had two heavy bags full of my products hanging from my wrists to use as an excuse for the lame hug. My beautiful star! Aunt Kitty called across the salon as she hurried over, nudged Jammy aside, and threw her arms around me. Aunt Kitty rocked me back and forth, and then finally let go, held me at an arm's distance, looked me over, then pulled me back in for another hug. I'm so proud of you, baby. I smiled and turned to put my bags down on the reception desk, but stopped when I realized someone was sitting there. Oh, Mariah, meet Ellen, our new receptionist. Jammy gestured to the attractive woman. Ellen slid off the counter and slapped a perfectly manicured hand to her chest. Mariah Starr? Oh my goodness, I have to admit, I'm fangirling a little over here. I've heard so much about you. I grinned and made a face at Jammy and Aunt Kitty. I'm sure that whatever you heard, only half of it is true. These two tend to embellish when it comes to singing my praises. Aunt Kitty shook her head empathetically. Oh no, she's used your products. She knows all our bragging is the truth. Jammy pointed to the half-empty bottle of my Bubbles brand lotion on top of the desk. See? Ellen nodded. I'm completely hooked on your products. I've fallen in love with everything I've tried. Your latest fragrance, Aquatic Evening, is to die for. I nodded. Ah, bergamot, neroli, and jasmine. Ellen clapped her hands together in a prayer pose like she was about to fall on her knees and start worshipping me. I bought soap, lotion, leave-in conditioner, bath bombs, and whipped body butter all in that fragrance. She cupped her hand around her mouth as if her next words were private. Which isn't easy on a receptionist budget. No offense, Jammy. Jammy mock scowled. I laughed and held up my finger. Hold that thought. I'll be right back. I hurried out to my seven-year-old Honda Civic. It was packed to the gills with the supplies from my latest trip to the warehouse of my raw materials supplier in Miami. Digging through everything, I found the box with the gift bags in the back, underneath a pile of sun-kissed bombs. I checked it to make sure everything in it was in tip-top shape, then carried a couple back inside. Jammy had returned to her client, but Ellen and Aunt Kitty were still standing next to the front desk, talking. I smiled inwardly as I heard them ooing and aahing over my products and comparing favorites. Ellen seemed a little different in that she was dressed to the nines to work as a salon receptionist. Not a single strand of her golden blonde hair was out of place. She looked so perfect it might have been off-putting if it wasn't for the huge Bambi eyes, adorable dimples, and the sweet smile on her face. When I handed her the gift bag full of sample products, she was so grateful I thought she might try to give me her firstborn. She threw herself at me in a tight hug. Oh, I'll treasure this. I can't believe how generous you are on top of all that talent. I was flattered she loved my products, but awkward. I'd already been nearly smothered by Jammy and Aunt Kitty. Jammy saw that I was a little uncomfortable and broke us apart. All right, Ellen, don't squeeze the life out of my favorite supplier. I grinned and picked my bags off the floor. If you need more of anything, let me know. I make samples all the time. I'll gladly let you go through my stockpile. Or you can go shopping for yourself in a few weeks when she opens her new bath and body care boutique. Aunt Kitty grabbed my shoulders and playfully shook me. 
I'm so proud of you. I can't wait until you open the doors of your new place. I'm only sad it will be at the other end of the island. My eyes widened at her loose lips. I wasn't hugely superstitious, but I suppose some of my mother's beliefs in sorcery, magic, and the occult might have rubbed off on me, no matter how much I tried to distance myself from the negatives of my upbringing. Still, I didn't want to talk too much about my plans before they manifested, or I might end up jinxing myself. Aunt Kitty, you're opening a shop here on the island? Well, that's great news. Ellen looked down at the bag of full-sized products I'd given her and tried to hand it back to me. You sure you want to give me these? Maybe wait until the shop opens and I'll come in and buy them. I pushed her hand away and shook my head. Don't be silly. It's a gift. Besides, I'm not sure the store is opening. Pshaw! Jammy waved her scissors in the air. Of course it is. You've had a business plan in place for years. But if the lease doesn't come through, I frowned and looked away. I'd already bitten my nails till they bled worrying over the lease. It's going to. Everyone knows Megan. She's a sweetheart, and once she looks over the paperwork she's going to lease to you, she's all about helping women business owners. What's this about leasing Megan's place? I turned and saw Parker Pettit pushing her way into the salon. She lifted her sunglasses to the top of her head with one hand and maneuvered a baby stroller with the other. Don't tell me you're the one who put in an offer to lease her building, Mariah? Parker gave the stroller a final shove with her hip. I scooted out of the way and smiled down at sweet little Stella. I'm the one trying to. No kidding. It's a brand new building. Hurricane Matilda flattened the previous place. Megan's been busy with her new little addition, but I'm pretty sure she's eager to get it leased. I felt my chest flutter. You think so? I don't want to be pushy and risk losing the place altogether, but I've been waiting for word and I'm super anxious. Tell you what, we've been staying at Megan's mother's place since the baby was born. I'm headed up north with Heidi and Hannah to see her and Roman and their new Munchkin Cade tomorrow. I can ask her about it. Oh my god, would you? I don't want to bother her, but this is so important to me. Leave it to me, I'll take care of it. In fact, I'll call her right now and get the ball rolling. Just keep an eye on Stella for me. She pushed the stroller toward me and opened the door. But you'll owe me. Layla came over and peeked into the gift bags I was still holding. Do you have more of the coconut and lime scented hair oil? I've been out for a week, both at home and here in the salon, and I'm slowly going insane. I put the bags down in front of Stella and knelt to search out the hair oil. What did Parker mean by that, that I'll owe her? Layla snorted. It means she's going to try to set you up soon. Set me up? She's putting together a matchmaking service for special clients. Layla winked, letting me know she meant shifter clients. She's already gotten three matches, or at least she's taking credit for three matches. Ellen perked up. She can set me up? No, it's not something you want. It's something that just happens to you, like a force of nature. Layla laughed. Parker just hits you like a bus, and then next thing you know, you're in a serious relationship, and she's talking about how she should be credited on your wedding invitations. I shook my head. Hard pass. I'll owe her in another way. I'm too busy for a boyfriend. I've got a million things going on, and if she's really helping me get that lease, I'm about to be even busier. Aunt Kitty sighed. Mariah, you know you have people to help you. You hired two employees that you're basically paying to stand around and watch you work. Those kids want to pitch in. Besides, I've known you since you were a teenager, and I've never known you to be in a serious relationship. Kitty was my father's sister, but she and I hadn't met until after my mother died when I was 17. I'd never known my father, but I found some paperwork with his name on it when I was going through my mother's things. So I looked him up. Unfortunately, he died a few years after I was born, but lucky for me, I found Aunt Kitty, who welcomed me with open arms just like she'd known me my whole life. In the time I'd known her, Aunt Kitty had been a better mother to me than my own had. 
I've dated. I found the oil and handed two bottles to Layla. I dated a few different guys. Well, I'd been on a couple of first dates, a couple of quick hookups. I was honestly too busy for a relationship, and that wasn't just an excuse. Good news! Parker flew back into the salon, grinning from ear to ear, and tapped me on the tip of my nose. You've got the lease. I'll be honest here. It was never a question of whether you'd get it or not. All I did was light a fire under Megan. She's getting in touch with the property manager as we speak. Layla patted me on the back. Now for the bad news. It's not bad news. Parker's hands flew to her hips and her eyes flashed with mock anger. Then she turned to me with an unwavering grin. Not a single one of my matches is unhappy or ungrateful. I'm going to find you the perfect man. Aunt Kitty laughed loudly and backed away before giving Parker advice. Girl, meet your twin. She may be pretty, smart, and accomplished, but Mariah here is as stubborn as they come. Parker shot Kitty a challenging look. I can find a man who likes stubborn women, Jamie laughed. I don't think that's what she meant. I grabbed my bags and went to assess the display shelf where my products were displayed. I was going to need to make more than one trip to the car to refill everything. Why didn't you let me know you were almost out of everything, Jamie? Ellen waved her hand. That'll be part of my job duties from now on. Do you have a card you could leave with me? Parker wheeled Stella over. Wait, I wasn't done. Why don't you seem excited about the perfect man? She narrowed her eyes at me. You're not going to be as complicated as these other women, are you? Layla scoffed and Fern poked her head out of the massage room in the back. I wasn't complicated. Also, thank God you're here. I need some massage bars. I love the Shea and Carnauba blend, and I'm low on several of my scented oils. I'm not complicated at all, just not interested. Parker sighed. One day I'll have someone come to me and beg me to match them up super simple and uncomplicated. Ellen looked like she was going to shoot up from her seat. I just ignored them and kept filling the shelves. Once I finished at Jammies, I had six other businesses to visit just on the islands alone. I also had three personal clients waiting for deliveries. The last thing I had time for was a man, perfect or not. Chapter 2. Patton I stretched out on my deck chair and pulled the brim of my hat down over my face to block the rays. It was noon, judging by the blinding sun, on a Tuesday. No, a uh, Friday. Hell, I had no idea what day it was. I'd been on my boat for days, kicking back, doing a little fishing, a little swimming, and a lot of nothing much. I loved hanging out, staying out of arm's reach of the rat race on the island. My only company was a cooler full of beer, my guitar, and my good buddy Dylan when he finished his work for the day. I must have checked out for a midday snooze because when Dylan tossed my phone onto my stomach, I startled. Jake keeps calling. Call him back or shut the damn thing off. He's interrupting my concentration. I reached over and grabbed another can of beer from the cooler. You're like an old lady sometimes, you know that? Look who's taking a nap in the middle of the afternoon. I'm still trying to figure out why I let you talk me into this. Brittany's having a shit fit. I was supposed to be back in Miami weeks ago. He snatched the beer from me before I had a chance to open it and held it over my prone body before pulling the tab so it spit on my stomach. I scowled. Nice, appreciate that. Brittany? I thought her name was Ashley. He sighed and sank into the beach chair next to me. That's the other one, I snickered. An entire harem and you can't stay away from my charm and great personality. I'm honored. Fucking hardly. My phone started ringing again and Dylan met my eyes with a look that pointedly dared me to ignore it again. I shrugged. Must be important. He's called half a dozen times. He raised his brows. Well, I ignored the call and grabbed another beer. Just because it's important to him doesn't mean it's important to me. Dylan snorted a laugh. He's going to kick your ass. I knew Dylan was probably remembering some of the old brawls we'd all had when we were younger. Jake was five years older than us, and even though I was a bear shifter, like my brother, and Dylan was a lion shifter, 
Jake had been substantially bigger until we were around 15. He used to wipe the floor with us. He can try. Since he has found a mate, he's gone soft. We'll see. You keep ignoring him, and I'm assuming he'll show up here eventually. He can try that, too. I swiped the keys to his boat, so he won't get very far. Laughing, Dylan took a long pull from his beer. Did you ever think that maybe that's the reason he's calling? He wants to take his boat out and can't find the keys? So, why are you hiding from him? I'm not hiding, I'm just on vacation. Didn't you just have a vacation a couple of months ago? Why are you here again? Dylan held up his beer at me. Yeah, yeah, I hear ya. To be fair, though, my job is location independent. I'm a digital nomad, so I have been working. In fact, I got several jobs going on currently. Yeah, creating a site for that shifter mate matching service. I shook my head. You ought to be ashamed of that, bro. We bachelors are already a dying breed. Here you are, helping to take us down. You got lured to the dark side. They have. I threw my hands up. Don't say cookies. Women. He leaned his head back and winced when the sun beamed into his eyes. If I didn't know any better, Patton, I'd never guess you were a grizzly bear. A yellow-bellied chicken, maybe. First, you hide from Jake. Second, you're terrified of finding a mate. You're one to talk, pussy. Dylan slid his sunglasses from atop his head down over his eyes. What? I've never heard that joke before. I am so impressed by your sparkling wit. I grinned and folded my arms behind my head. I'm going back to my nap. Sleep tight, Grandma. After a few minutes, my phone started to ring again. I ignored it. I didn't even acknowledge the ring, knowing my nonchalance would get Dylan's goat. Seems Jake really has his panties in a twist over something. How do you know nothing bad has happened? If it was serious, he'd get in touch. I tapped my head. It's not like I'm blocking his thoughts all that much. He's going to pulverize you. Well, then I won't have to do whatever job it is he's trying to pawn off on me. I sighed and rolled my neck. Just thinking about uptight Jake and his lists, agendas, and ambitions had my shoulder muscles tightening. Fuck. Just call him and see what he wants. He wants me to work. Then work. I'm on fucking vacation. Didn't we already establish that? When the phone started up again, I tossed it over the side of the boat and into the water. Dylan swallowed the last of his beer and grunted. Yep, I'm going to be the star witness at Jake James's fratricide trial. And you think he won't murder you too? On cue, Dylan's phone started ringing from the cabin below deck. He swore and stood up. I'm going to tell him that you just threw your phone overboard. Snitches get stitches. That's real mature, Patton. What are we, 12? I sighed and chugged the rest of my beer. I knew Jake would show up eventually and ruin my serenity, but I planned to squeeze every second of rest and relaxation out of my furlough before he did. Now that a nap seemed out of the question, I scooted the cooler over, plopped my guitar on my knee, and strummed a few lines of the song I was working on. Yeah, he threw his phone overboard, so don't waste your time calling it. Dylan emerged from the cabin below and smacked the back of my head as he walked by. That's what I told him. No way he could be sure it wasn't an emergency unless he answered. Oh, fuck off, both of you. I muttered and protected my head from Dylan's claws, giving him the evil eye. What do you mean, what's up his ass? Isn't he always like this? Dylan was countering my evil eye by pressing his lips together tightly, trying to fight laughter. Sure, hold on. I glared at him as he tried to hand the phone to me. He waved it impatiently. Take it, he wants to talk to you. When I made no move to take it, he grabbed my arm and tried to wrestle the phone into my hand. He eventually just tossed it onto my lap. Fucking answer, asshole. I grabbed the phone, stood, got Dylan in a chokehold, and held the phone out in front of my face. Then, I spoke loudly so there was no mistaking my words. I am on vacation. Dylan released an exasperated grunt when he heard the splash of his phone going into the water. Yanking away from me, he stared over the side with his hands on his hips. I fucking hate you. I needed to have a phone meeting with Parker in an hour. 
Well, then, score one for all the unmated men on the island. I just won us a battle in the war on bachelorhood. Dylan snorted. Lucky I keep a backup phone for shit like this. I never know what pain in the ass thing you'll do next. Why do I feel like I brought my wife on this trip with me? Whoa, keep it in your pants, Becky. I'm definitely not interested in playing house with you. What? Am I not your type? Not even if you were rocking the perfect set of double Ds and weren't swinging that little worm between your legs. As he walked back into the cabin, he was still muttering, Place is a wreck. Live like a pig. Insult to pigs. Chapter 3. Mariah Less than a week after Parker's phone call to Megan, we were meeting at the building on Main Street to sign the lease. My heart raced, and I felt I was about to hurl the full breakfast I'd eaten that morning at Bayfront Diner. It was a two-year lease, and I'd be paying a huge chunk of change per month. Not that the amount was unfair. In fact, one could argue that it was a little less than the going rate for commercial rentals in the area, and the location was fabulous. Megan, it seemed, had a strong affinity for female business owners. Still, it was a hefty sum to me. Once I signed on the dotted line, I would be legally bound to a building that would soon have my branding displayed inside and out. The pen in my hand shook. Parker and Megan were busy comparing childbirth experiences, like fishermen compare tales of the one that got away. Both were oblivious to the internal crisis I was having. Roman didn't even get woozy in the delivery room? Cause Maxim went down. Oh, he was pale, all right, white as a ghost, but I was blessed with a short delivery time. Kate practically shot out. Another 15 minutes or so, I'm not sure Roman wouldn't have met the ground, too. Megan grinned down at her infant son, who was sleeping in some sort of sling contraption draped across her middle. Don't tell Maxim I squealed. He thinks it contradicts his tough guy persona. No worries there. I'm quite aware of the macho bravado the polar guys like to display. I live with one of those he-men, too. The property manager, Tim, tapped another place I needed to initial. And sign at the bottom, please. I started to sign. My pen was poised over the page. I swallowed a huge lump in my throat. Tell me I'm not making a mistake. Had I said that aloud? Parker and Megan looked over at me with raised eyebrows. Parker leaned closer and squeezed my shoulder. Second thoughts. I shook my head. It's just, uh, this is huge. Megan nodded knowingly and gave Parker an I told you so glance before she moved closer, scooting Tim out of the way. Are you absolutely certain that opening a shop to sell your own products is something you really want? I want it more than anything. It's my dream. I've been working my ass off for years. I fanned my face with the papers. It's just crazy that it's happening. It's not crazy, and it didn't come out of the blue. I've seen your products around the island for years, and I've been using them for just as long. You infuse a little of yourself in every product you sell. That's why people fall all over themselves to buy them. I've been where you are. It's scary. And you're going at it alone. I had a husband for support, not that he was much in the way of support, but that's another story. Anyway, you've got us. We're here for you if you need a shoulder to lean on or complain to or bounce ideas off of and whatever. Parker grabbed my other shoulder and shook me. Megan's absolutely right, especially the part about you having us for support. We're here whenever you need us. Megan swayed back and forth while she talked, rocking the sleeping Cade. The point is, this next step makes logical sense. You've built a strong foundation. It's time to take it to the next level. None of us have any doubt that you'll attack it head on, like you have everything else, and you will succeed. Parker slapped her arm across my shoulders. You're going to be great! I blinked back sudden tears and nodded. Right, right. Sorry, I just had a moment of self-doubt. <sighs> Sorry. Megan shook her head. 
no apologies. Every entrepreneur goes through the same thing. It's a rite of passage. Parker snorted. She's not lying. I finished signing and initialing the documents and blew out a huge breath. I did it. Megan clapped her hands together. Should we crack open a bottle of bubbly and really celebrate? Ha ha, clever. I see what you did there. I scanned the space that was now officially leased to me, looking around like I was seeing it for the first time. I pulled out my iPad and stylus and started scribbling, adding to the list of changes that needed to be made in order to showcase my products. I think we lost her, Parker sighed. We should definitely still have the champagne, though. Your house? Megan hesitated. Mariah, you want to celebrate at my place? I glanced briefly at the women, both eyeing me with hopeful expressions. I'd just put pen to paper and formalized a major commitment. There was no time to celebrate. I needed to get to work. I'm going to pass on that. I'm anxious to get started here. My first step is to hire a contractor ASAP. I've done some research, but I haven't made any calls yet. I didn't want to jinx myself. Parker lit up, and the look in her eyes would have alarmed me if I'd known her better. As it was, I just thought she was excited to help. Oh, I know the perfect contractor for you. Megan raised her eyebrows and moved away from us, suddenly very interested in the walls. Okay. James Construction. They've been around the island for decades, a second-generation family business. I'm sure they're on your list since they're the only construction company based in Sunkiss Key. I nodded. I've heard of them. Yes, they're on my list to call for estimates. Well, I just shorten your list. They're local, they're run by a wonderful shifter family. And I just so happen to be friends with Jake James' mate, Chantilly Lawson, well, Tilly James now. I'll make a call and see if I can't have a meeting set up for you as soon as this afternoon. This afternoon? I remember Tilly saying that Jake and his crew just finished a big job in Miami and are looking to take on something smaller, something local. Her eyes twinkled mischievously, and my stomach fluttered with nerves. They do great work. I wouldn't suggest them if I didn't think they couldn't turn this place into the place of your dreams. Hold up. Is this another one of those you're gonna owe me favors? Because I'm still not in the market for a mate. She took my hand in hers. I'm not gonna lie. Is one of the James's brothers single? Yes. Do I think you two might hit it off? Yes. Am I going to try to push you two together? No. That last one didn't sound convincing. I frowned. No. She threw her hands in the air. I would still recommend them even if there were no single unmated hot brother. They do great work. On an island this size, if they didn't, they'd have gone out of business long ago. I walked over to the built-in counter and picked up my iPad again. I swiped to the file with the names of contractors and tapped the name at the top of the list, James Construction. I'd made a note beside their name that they'd received very good reviews and the pictures I'd seen of their work were impressive. Fine, whatever. I won't try to find you true love and set you up to have a blissfully romantic life. I'll stay out of it, she sighed. Even if I have a strong feeling about the two of you, however, she raised a finger in the air to punctuate her point, they'll probably be cheaper since they're local and don't have to travel far to the job site. Cheaper was good, and they did quality work. If they could get the job going quickly, even better. The faster I could get the shop opened, the faster I could start to recoup some of the startup capital I would just plonked down. And do you think you can set up a meeting with them for today? Parker's eyes lit up. Let me just give Tilly a call. Did you set Tilly and her mate up too? Megan laughed. If I remember correctly, Tilly and Jake met before the whole Cybermates idea. And Parker, didn't you tell me that those two went together about as well as a fork and an electrical outlet? Parker shot Megan a scowl and crossed her arms over her chest. 
It's not an exact science, okay? So sue me. You might not want to suggest that if you're really serious about the Cybermates thing. Someone might take you up on that. Serious about it? I'll have you know that Dylan's putting the finishing touches on the website as we speak. I've been signing clients up left and right. Under heavy pressure. And I've already made several matches. A bit of an exaggerated claim, Parker growled at Megan. A little more support directed my way would be nice. I looked away from them, grinning. All right, Parker, give your friend Tilly a call. See if you can set something up for as soon as possible. But I'll say this loud and clear. I am not, under any circumstances, looking for a man. Chapter 4. Patton I made the mistake of docking my boat on the north end of the island to pick up another case of beer. Jake instantly sniffed me out and was climbing aboard Castaway before I could pull her away from the dock. Instead of a clean getaway like I'd hoped, I was stuck with a growling grizzly on my deck verbally tearing into me while I drank a cold one and tried to pretend he was a figment of my imagination. I've been calling you for days. What the actual hell is wrong with you? I laughed. Want a list? Because that might take a while. I'm being serious here, Patton. I need you at the office. I'm already a day late for my trip because of you. Where are you going? My stomach clenched and I grunted. Why are you leaving town? Tilly's mother is having hip replacement surgery and Tilly wants me there for her. She flew out of Miami this morning and I couldn't go with her because I had to track down your useless ass and drag you back to town first. He braced his hands on his hips and shook his head. Why this always happens is beyond me, Patton. You're 34 fucking years old. You're a grown man. When I need you, I should be able to get a hold of you. So, Tilly wants to be at her mom's bedside. Why are you going? To support my mate, that's why, asshole. God, you're so pussy-whipped. You used to be so much cooler, Jake. Jake charged me, hitting me square in the gut with his shoulder and taking me down. Before I could set my beard down and fight back, he sucker-punched me in the ribs and buried his knee in my balls. I screamed and tapped the floor. I give, I give. God, that scrotal shot was a low blow even for you, man. Jake got off me, stood, and angrily pointed down at me. Be careful how you talk about my mate. I rolled to the side, still clutching my balls. I wasn't talking about Tilly. I love Tilly. I was talking about you. And you almost just popped one of my testicles. What the fuck? I need you to show up at work. That's what the fuck. I'm going to be gone for a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks? He grimaced. I'm not in love with the idea of leaving you in charge for that long either. Oh, come down off the high horse. I can run James Construction with my eyes closed and you know it. I know you can. I don't know that you will. I'm not fucking around with you. I accepted a job. It's small and it's local. A woman named Mariah Starr is turning the building that used to be Pratt's Photography into a storefront to sell her handmade toiletries. Mariah Starr? Is she a stripper? Patton. Toiletries, Jesus. This just keeps getting better. The shop is in mint condition, newly constructed after the hurricane leveled it. We just need to do custom build-outs, shelving, cabinetry, display cases. Also, she wants changes to the existing flooring, lighting, and an interior paint job. There's a rush on it. I told her we could have the job completed in two weeks. She's counting on that. She'll be advertising her grand opening, so we'll have to be done and out of there on schedule. I grimaced. When is the start date? Tomorrow. I'm leaving for Miami within the hour and flying out to Seattle tonight. You need to show up to the job in the morning and get things going. He sighed and looked away. I'm serious, Patton. It's a small job, but if you fuck this up, we're going to look like major dickheads. The job's for a friend of a friend. Who's the friend? Parker Pettit. Oh, great. Her again. I rolled my eyes. Since when are you friends with the enemy? Tilly and Parker are friends. If you fuck up and piss Parker off and she talks to Tilly and Tilly gets pissed off at me, I will burn this fucking boat to ashes. Pussy whipped. He swung a right hook, but I ducked. 
I swear to God, Patton, if it wouldn't upset Mom and Dad so much, I'd murder you right here and toss your body overboard as chum for the fishes. For God's sake, I'm not dissing Tilly. You're the one whose head is so far up her ass. I'm surprised she can walk without a limp. Relax. I've worked jobs by myself more times than I can count. I can do this shit in my sleep. Go get out of here. You've got a mate waiting, he grunted. I love you, but you're a pain in the ass, just so you know. Love you too, jackass. I pulled myself up and followed him out onto the deck. So the job starts next Friday and I can let the rest of the guys take lead? He turned around ready to fight until he saw the grin on my face. I take it back. I actually hate you. You're going to be the death of me and I wish I would have gone into anything other than the family business. Yeah, yeah. Don't you have a plane to catch? He pulled something out of his pocket and tossed it at me. Do not throw that one in the ocean. I looked down at the new shiny cell phone and pretended to throw it overboard. When Jake gasped, I laughed and shoved it into my pocket. Relax, you're way too tense. His face sobered. His expression was probably more serious than I'd ever seen it. I wish I could. I wish you'd meet me in the middle with this business so I could relax and enjoy my mate more instead of worrying about it all the damn time. I didn't have a response for that, so I just shrugged like I didn't care and nudged the back of a deck chair with my foot. He left after that, and I did my best to ignore how much what he just said impacted me. There was a time when I was younger that I cared about the business. I tried hard to learn and attempted to carve my niche, but whatever I did, no matter how hard I tried, I'd always been two steps behind Jake. He was older, smarter, and more experienced. There came a point when I got tired of always living in Jake's shadow. Eventually, I just gave up and stopped trying. Shit. My neck and shoulder muscles were tight. My chest felt heavy. Castaway was supposed to be my no-stress zone. I breathed in deeply and chanted in my head, Life is great. Everything is wonderful. Jake did not just leave me feeling like a total dick. I will not feel guilty. I will not worry about him. I settled into my chair and slung my guitar over my knee. Inhaling a big breath of salty ocean air, I shut my eyes while I strummed a melody and attempted to reach my zen. Dylan's footsteps grew near and he cleared his throat. Feeling like a putz, are we? Get the fuck off my boat. You're stressing me out, too. Chapter 5. Mariah oh, My stomach was in knots. I was shaking in my kid's sneakers. It wasn't like me to make such a snappy decision about anything, much less choosing a contractor. I always made lists, weighed pros and cons, compared statistics, analyzed. But after Parker's recommendation and after meeting Jake James myself to discuss details, I had a good vibe about James' construction. Jake James struck me as dedicated and serious when it came to his work. We were the same in that regard. Still, today was the day construction commenced, another huge milestone for me. And I was as nervous today as when I'd signed the lease. My stomach did cartwheels and I was at serious risk of throwing up my coffee, which was the only thing I'd ingested that morning since I'd been too nervous for breakfast. I couldn't stop second-guessing myself. I was terrified that I'd made a mistake and everything I'd worked so hard for would crumble. If I didn't get the construction finished and the shop in tip-top shape before the scheduled date, I would have to push the grand opening back. That would be disastrous. I'd already called this morning to take out ads in both the Sunkissed Key Chronicle and the Herald, advertising the grand opening of Bubbles Boutique. Cody and Emily spent a couple of hours last night distributing the flyers I'd printed up to local businesses. I'd planned everything to a T, and I was doing everything in my power to ensure that my plans were carried out without a hitch. I might spend the next two weeks in a state of hyper-anxiety, but I waited nearly half my life for this. It was everything to me, and it was finally within my reach. The anxiety was full on when Jake called me at about 
I had already been pacing outside the storefront, wondering what time I should expect the work crew to show up. Hey, how's it going over there? Jake sounded a little nervous himself. I checked my watch. Fine, fine, just waiting for your crew to arrive. There was a long hesitation. It stretched on for so long that I wondered if the call had dropped. Finally, Jake came back on the line. Patton is heading up the crew right now. He should be there soon. He's probably at the office, giving the guys a rundown of what the job will entail. Patton? Jake cleared his throat. Yeah, my brother. Uh, something came up and I had to leave town for a bit. My mate's mother is having surgery, so we flew to the West Coast to be with her. My stomach sank to the bottom of my feet. So you're not going to be here? No, but that's nothing to worry about. Patton could do this job in his sleep. If I'm being honest, and I'll deny it if you repeat it, he's probably better at the cabinetry and finishing work than I am. He's got skilled fingers and an eye for detail. He muttered something that I didn't catch and sighed. I'm really sorry that I can't be there, Mariah. I know you're worried about the grand opening of your shop and concerned about everything going smoothly, but I promise you the construction job will be done on time. I caught sight of my reflection in the store window and almost groaned. I'd been running on very little sleep. My hair was a mess and flying in every direction. My eyes had puffy bags. I was dressed like I'd just crawled out of the bottom of a dumpster with threadbare jeans riddled with holes and a faded, wrinkled T-shirt. My keds were the only item of clothing purchased in this decade and only because it wouldn't do for a woman constantly on the run to be wearing ten-year-old shoes. I didn't look like a fashion model, but I did look like a woman intent on getting some work done. Only work wasn't getting done. Mariah? Yeah, I'm here. Um, okay, if you think it'll still be finished on time, then that's fine. I'm sure it will. In fact, I'll call Patton right now and double check that he's on his way. We ended the call, and I went inside with the driving need to do something, anything to distract myself. The main floor of the shop was going to be the focus of the construction work. The office was fine the way it was. I didn't need anything fancy in there. The workroom in the back was perfect. It just needed my equipment and shelving units set up. A couple of industrial-sized stand mixers and a bath bomb press were the heaviest pieces of equipment I had, and they were currently still being used in the dining room, living room, and spare bedroom of my house. I saw no need to dump extra money into fixing up a production area or storage space in the back that wouldn't be seen by customers anyway. My two full-time employees, Emily and Cody, were both fresh out of high school. Cody wasn't strong enough to carry the equipment by himself, but he was great about being able to recruit friends to help when I needed it. I didn't mind slipping them a few bucks here and there rather than lugging around those stand mixers myself. Emily and Cody were both working out of my house until the shop was ready. Today, they were working on a batch of specialty bath bombs for a wholesale client, but they would be done before noon and then head over to see what I needed done here. Everything from the looks of it. I pulled my hair up and bound most of it in a scrunchie. A few of the shorter strands fell out. I felt overwhelmed just standing around waiting I had a list on my iPad app to keep me on track and doing what I was supposed to be doing. According to my list, my morning should be spent going over the construction plans in more detail with the crew and answering any questions they had. Basically, help them get the job started off in the right direction. But they weren't here. I didn't have anything to do until Pat and James showed up. I blew out a frustrated breath. Apparently, Patton was not like Jake. Patton was late on his first day of work. I already felt like strangling the man, and I hadn't even met him yet. I paced the front of the shop, then to the back, and then I stood on the sidewalk out front watching traffic go by. I tried to calm myself by taking note of just how many vehicles passed by. Megan had assured me that this was a good location, and she hadn't lied. In fact, it was a great location. Anyone coming on or going off the island would pass my shop. Too bad those thoughts didn't soothe me any. 
If the construction got backed up and my grand opening had to be rescheduled, it would not bode well when it came to making a positive first impression on new customers. I was quickly coming to the conclusion that I'd made a major mistake hiring James Construction. My first real action as a brick-and-mortar business owner, and I'd screwed up. I plopped myself down on the sidewalk and rested my elbows on my knees. For 12 years, I'd been marketing and selling my brand to businesses all throughout the Miami area, and I'd spent a good six years before that perfecting formulas for products. Twelve years I'd been selling and saving and planning and working my ass off to have my own place, Bubbles Boutique. Here I was, so close I could taste it. If this Pat and James guy didn't get his backside here, the man was going to get a stern talking to from me. No, he was going to get an all-out ass-chewing, a well-deserved one too. I'll be damned if I was going to let him mess this up for me. My phone rang and I hopped to my feet. I pressed the phone to my ear, hoping it was Pat and James calling to let me know he was on his way. It wasn't. Hey, boss lady, Emily and I are finished with these bath bombs. Already? Cody laughed. Yeah, it's an easy recipe and there are no special magical splashes of whatever all that extra stuff is you do, so it went fast. What do you need from us now? I ran through the list of things that needed to be done in my head and tried to figure out what would be the simplest, most mindless tasks for them to handle. Miss Mariah, come on, we can do anything you need doing. He said something to Emily in the background that I couldn't hear. Emily says the same, give us something harder. Emily came over the line. You already have the sense mix for the new lotions. We could prepare them and get them bottled. Cody agreed. Yeah, I saw you had the labels already printed out and ready to go. I squeezed my eyes shut and cursed Pat and James once again for being late. If he'd been on time, I could have run home and gone through the process with Emily and Cody to make sure they knew exactly how to do it and that everything was just the way I needed it to be. As it was, I was stuck at the shop until he showed. I couldn't risk missing him. Um... Fine, I know that sound. We'll just clean up and get everything sorted here. I hesitated and groaned. I'm sorry, Cody, it's not that I don't trust you and Emily. It's just that you're anal about everything and this is your baby. We know, we know. I smiled despite my stress. Most people don't call their bosses anal. Most bosses expect their employees to work for their paycheck. Touché. I sighed and tried to force myself to relax. How about you two start packing the items that are already completed? The boxes are on my couch. The tape roller is on the hook in your office, I know. Cody groaned. And don't go snooping in your bedroom, I know, I know. I wasn't going to say not to go snooping in my bedroom. So we can snoop? Absolutely not, I hesitated. Stay out of my bedroom. Laughing, he hung up and left me shaking my head, my anxiety still running high. Time crawled by. I sat there fighting the urge to call Jake back and tell him to forget it, that I'd find another company, except there probably weren't any other companies that could have the job finished in two weeks. This whole thing had been too good to be true, and now I had a grand opening date that I had to stick to, and a construction company. That was M-I-A. When noon came and there was still no sign of Patton, I was so angry that I was shaking. My blood was boiling and I swore that the very first thing I was going to do when he did show up was fire his ass. If he did show up. It was after 1 p.m. when an oversized truck pulled into the lot. Could barely see straight, I was so furious. I stood up, dusted off my ass, and balled my hands into fists at my sides, desperate to either give this good for nothing that kept me waiting a piece of my mind or to punch his lights out. As a parrot shifter, I wasn't the toughest of breeds by any means, but I could do some damage if I wanted to, and my inner bird was fighting to get out and pluck this Pat and James's eyeballs out. 
the driver's door opened and a man stepped out. His back was to me. The sun glinted off the shiny chrome on his truck so I couldn't make out anything about him except for his enormous size. He was probably six and a half feet tall and broad-shouldered. He stretched out his heavily muscled arms before he turned to me and froze. We stared at one another. My stomach clenched hard and my bird fluttered her wings, my anger twisted into desire, and my fists went lax at my sides. There was no doubt. The man standing there, staring back at me, was my mate. I still couldn't quite make out his face, but I didn't need to. He smelled like sunshine, salt air, and a rainstorm rolling in from the sea all at once. My breath caught in my throat. I took a step back, stunned stupid. When he finally moved to take a step closer, I saw his face. He was similar enough in appearance to Jake James that I knew I was staring at Jake's brother, Patton James. Patton James, the lousy, good-for-nothing slug that had kept me waiting all morning, was my mate. This was so not good. Chapter 6, Patton I swore out loud. The woman standing in front of the building that was once Pratt's photography was my mate. I knew it instantly. I could sense it loud and clear, just like I could sense the combination of both fury and arousal that rolled off her in waves. Waves? More like a tsunami. She smelled fresh and citrusy and sweet, like fresh squeezed lemonade. My mouth watered, my hands tingled at my sides, my dick sprang to life and started to harden. I ran my hands through my hair and tried to shake off the ripples of desire shooting through me. It almost hurt to look at her. She was that beautiful, tall, dark, and lovely. I turned back to my truck and braced my arms on the hood for a moment, trying to regain some composure. A few deep breaths later, I swung around and cleared my throat. My voice still came out a little shaky. Mariah? Although she was tall for a woman, statuesque, her body wasn't lacking curves. Her waist was narrow and her hips were full, filling out her ripped jeans. Her legs were about a mile long, smooth, dark brown skin showing through holes in the denim at the thighs and knees. Her skin was the color of perfectly prepared coffee dark roast with just a tiny splash of cream, and I had an overwhelming urge to trail my tongue over every inch of her. Her long arms crossed over a full chest, and her heart-shaped face hardened. Patton, hearing her say my name was like a stroke to the shaft of my cock, my eyes narrowed and my chin lowered. I stared intently at her, growling under my breath, and watched as her eyes widened and her cheeks darkened. It was torture fighting my bear when everything about the woman called to him to take her, claim her, breed her. That was my bear. Me? I couldn't think past how fucking hot she was. Pat and James. I groaned, took a deep breath, and gained dominance over my bear. Jerkily, my head nodded. Gotta stop saying my name, woman. I could hear the grinding of her molars from across the parking lot. I'm Mariah Starr, and you are late. Very late. Despite her posture and facial expression, hands on hips with a nasty scowl, I detected a tremor in her voice. I couldn't have drawn my eyes away from her deep ebony eyes to look at my watch even if I were wearing one. Oh, yeah? Jake told me you were going to start this morning. She swayed ever so slightly and took another step away from me. Smart of her. She was probably wise to get away while she still could. I followed. A slow grin spread over my face as I tracked her step for step. She could run. I would chase. The apex predator that resided within me thrilled at the idea of that game. Jake says a lot of things. My day begins first thing in the morning. If you're going to be working here, you need to arrive at 9 a.m., I don't have a lot of time for this construction work to be completed. She glanced away from me, toward the back of the truck. Where's your crew? My bear's possessiveness spiked. Crew? Why was she looking for other men? 
I would handle all her needs. Jesus, I had to gain a handle on my bear and quickly before he did something uncouth and not fit for polite society. Like throw her over our shoulder and carry her off to the boat for the rest of the day in a show of proprietorial dominance. Don't need them right now. She flinched slightly and grasped the door handle to the shop. Was that flinch because she felt the dominance of my bear? The way she shrank slightly and ducked into the shop quickly said she did. I needed to tone it down. I didn't want to scare her, and she didn't seem the type of woman to respond well to male posturing. Before following her inside, I adjusted myself in my pants to try and hide my erection. A futile move, really. Entering an enclosed space with Mariah was probably a bad idea, especially with her lemony sweet scent and those ripped jeans she had on. But I had little choice. I entered the shop and tucked my hands in my pockets to appear less threatening. The moment I stepped inside, though, it was obvious that the space was too small for both of us. She sucked in a sharp breath and stared up at me, her beautiful ebony eyes going heavy. Her tongue swiped out and over her lips before she caught the bottom one between her teeth and bit it slightly. I fought the urge to pull her to me and taste that plump lip myself. My bear was going crazy, but I still didn't want a mate. That hadn't changed. Fuck all. Why did my mate have to be so goddamn gorgeous? I pulled a hand free from my pocket and ran it through my hair. Gorgeous or not, I was in no place to assume the responsibilities that went along with mate bonding, like dropping everything to fly across the country and sit at a mate-in-law's bedside. I needed to remember that I was not ready. Forcing myself to stop staring at her, I squeezed my eyes shut and prayed for a pocket of air that wasn't filled with her delicious scent. So, did Jake fill you in on what I want? My bear growled at the sound of another man's name passing over her lips. Possessive asshole that he was, he didn't care that the name was my brother's or that Jake was already mated. Fuck Jake, I'll give you what you want. Excuse me? Crap, get it together, Patton. Uh, I mean, no, he didn't go into detail. He said you wanted shelves and display cases. I looked around the room, anywhere but at her. These shelves don't work for your toilet stuff? She growled a little growl of her own, a bit like a purr, the sexiest sound I'd ever heard. Toilet stuff? I glanced at her and swore under my breath again. She was even sexy when she was fuming, and she certainly was fuming. I could almost see steam shooting out of her ears. Uh, Jake said you made toiletries. She uncrossed her arms and then crossed them again, pushing her breasts up each time. I do a lot more than that. I develop and handcraft my own line of hair, body, and skincare products, as well as fragrances, candles, perfumes, and scented oils. Okay. This is ridiculous. She turned away from me and then spun back, pointing her finger at me in an accusatory way. I know we're mates. I raised my eyebrows. Okay. I don't know about you, but for me, this could not have happened at a worse time. I'm incredibly busy, far too busy for a relationship, especially with a man who doesn't seem to own a watch and doesn't give a damn about making a person wait on him all morning long. No. She shook her head and waved her hands in a keep-away gesture. No way. This mate thing is not happening. I must have been a sick bastard because something about her proclamation just turned me on even more. She was one tough cookie, my mate. I shrugged. Okay. Oh, for God's sake, stop saying okay. Did you hear what I said? I said we're mates. I laughed. I couldn't help it. She was cute, all fired up and sassy. Uh, fine. Jesus. She angrily pulled the scrunchie from her head, which made her hair fan out all around her, reminding me slightly of a lion's mane. Look, let's ignore any bonding pull between us and pretend we're not mates, cool? 
I would agree to that, but only so we could fuck and not have to worry about it turning into some kind of heavy, responsibility-laden arrangement like marriage or some shit. I wasn't into that kind of thing my brother had, dropping whatever else he had going on to be at his mate's side the second she snapped her fingers. I didn't like the way it looked on Jake, and I had no desire to become a member of Team Pussy Whipped. I did, however, have a desperate desire to know what Mariah tasted like, every inch of her. Fine. Fine. Just fine. I shrugged. Yeah, fine. We'll pretend we're not mates. Why are you fine with it? Why are you fine with it? She scowled. For the reasons I stated prior. I am incredibly busy. I barely have time to breathe. I certainly don't have time for any lovey-dovey crap. Not that I would want that with you anyway. I laughed again. All right, then. We're in agreement. Ignore the whole mate thing. Mates? What's mates? We're not mates. She stared at me for a few seconds more and then threw her hands up in the air, turned, and walked to the back of the room. When she got to the doorway, she paused and threw a glance over her shoulder. Are you going to be on time from now on? I grinned. Probably not. Chapter 7. Mariah. I blew out a rough breath and spun away from the man. Why? Why had fate cursed me with that man? I needed space. I needed a continent of space between us, like maybe I could get on a plane and fly to the other side of the planet. No, on second thought, I'd put him on a plane. Yeah, better idea. I figured I should start running down my list of area construction companies. I might get lucky and find someone who could fill in on such short notice. Perhaps there was a last-minute cancellation or something. Maybe I should try to hire someone else. It's obvious already that this isn't working out. His low growl sent shivers straight down my spine in a tingly coil of heat that unfurled in my core. You're not going to find anyone else who can be free right now and get the job done in two weeks. Even with us, you got lucky. We just finished a big job and our next one doesn't start for a couple of weeks. There must be someone. All right, go ahead. Call around and see. I'm just trying to save you the hassle. We're it. No one else will be able to complete the job in your two-week time frame. I turned back to him and frowned. It was hard to look at him straight on. My hormones were doing gymnastic tumbles and my bird was screeching in my brain that I needed to climb on him and ride him like a mechanical bull. No one? He shrugged like it wasn't a big deal. I'm your man, honey. I scowled. I am not your honey and you are not my man. He grinned annoyingly. For this job I am. Fine. I rubbed the back of my neck and wondered if I was going to have a heart attack. Fine. It's fine. Wanna show me what you have in mind? I groaned. What I had in mind was a whole lot of inappropriateness. My body was betraying me, the horny bitch. I had very important things to focus on, things far more essential than having an orgasm. It was becoming almost impossible for me to focus with him standing in the same room as me. I need five minutes. He snorted a quiet laugh. And you were complaining that I gave you all morning. I ignored him. It was either that or punch him in the face. I hurried out the front door and leaned against the building, taking deep breaths of patent-free air and doing my best to get a grip on myself. I just had to focus. If James Construction was my only option, then I'd suck it up and deal with Patton. It wasn't going to be easy, though. I glanced over my shoulder and found him staring out the front window at me, arms crossed and a hungry look on his face. Ah, oh, Christ. Snapping my head around, I grunted in exasperation when I heard his easy laughter. This was a joke to him. Sure, why wouldn't it be? He didn't have everything, all his hopes and dreams, riding on him keeping his shit together and pulling off this grand opening in impressive style. Given his casual demeanor and laid-back attitude, I doubted the man ever had his shit together or worried about anything. He was probably a perpetual man-child, shirking responsibility while everyone around him picked up his slack and held things together. 
He seemed too at ease to have ever really struggled for anything in his life. Even the rejection of a mate hadn't rocked his boat. Come on, Mariah, you faced tougher challenges. Running my hands down my face, I shook my head and straightened my spine. I had a job to do. I needed to keep my head in the game. Forcing a neutral expression, I went back inside and jumped straight to the business we needed to discuss. Okay, I have some sketches I marked up to give you an idea of what I'm looking for. Jake looked them over and said they were doable. I have my product dimensions as well. I grabbed my sketchbook and opened it on the counter. Turning to the first page, I slid it far enough away from me that Patton wouldn't need to stand too close to see it. Patton glanced at the paper for a moment and then turned his back to it, looking over the shop. Easy enough. Swallowing a wave of anger, I faked a thin smile. You don't want to look a little more closely? He turned his head to gaze down at me, and a cocky grin tilted the corners of his lips. Why? Is there some hidden cipher encoded in there somewhere? They're shelves, woman. Seething, I snatched the book away. First of all, don't call me woman. Not woman, not honey, and not sweetie, sugar, babe, or any other term of endearment. My name is Mariah Second. I expect you to give it more than a one-second cursory glance. I want a specific style of shelving. I want the bottom quarter to be cabinets that I can store extra product in. I want... I know, I saw, Mariah. He crossed his arms over his chest and cocked a brow. I've been helping on construction sites since I was old enough to toddle around in diapers. I've been heading up construction jobs since I was old enough to strap on a tool belt. And I've been reading blueprints since I learned the alphabet. Crude as yours may be, they're still blueprints. I saw what you have there. Now I'm mentally calculating the best spot to place the supports and run the plumbing lines for those two sinks in your blueprint. I glared at him. My hands curled into fists. Why couldn't you have just said that? Probably because you were too busy ranting and raving at me. Are you done, woman? I snapped the sketchbook closed and clenched my jaw. I'd never wanted to hurt someone so much in my entire life. Leave the book. I'll look at the dimensions and pick up all the supplies I need tonight. I'm going to be here, unfortunately. I paced away from him and gestured toward the workroom in the back. I don't want or need anything done in there, but I will be moving in some equipment, and then I'll be using the room as my production room. Is that going to be a problem? Depends on how the plumbing lines run. This is a new building, so it should be straightforward with no unforeseen kinks, but I still might need to get in there. Fine, fine, just give me a heads up if you do. It's imperative I keep a very clean environment. I can't allow anything to inadvertently fall into my batches and end up in my products. I ran a hand over my hair, patting it down a bit. I have a key for you if you need access after hours, and I'm not available. Cool. He turned his hand out to me, a challenge in his eyes. I sighed, turned, and bent over to rifle through my bag on the ground. His groaning exhale made me straighten quickly. I spun and glared at him. Don't do that. Well, don't bend over in front of me, woman. What the fuck do you expect, wiggling your ass in the air like that? I didn't wiggle. Ugh! Tossing the key at him, I snatched my bag off the floor and marched to the exit. You better watch your behavior. My employees are going to be here with me, and I will not have you ogling me, growling, or calling me woman. You're working for me. I expect professional behavior from you at all times. Make you a deal. I'll keep mine in my pants if you keep yours in your pants. He followed me on the way out. I stared at him like he'd lost his mind. I can assure you that will not be a problem, he shrugged. Look, just so we're clear, I'm not looking to start anything either. I'll grab the supplies tonight and start work tomorrow. Sometime. Has anyone ever attempted to murder you before? He laughed and cracked a wide grin, which, much to my dismay, turned his face into something even more devastatingly handsome. Why? You looking to compare notes? 
My nostrils flared as I locked the door to my new building while he strolled casually to his truck, climbed in, and drove off. Seething, I made sure the door was locked, got into my car, and sat there for a long moment. My head fell forward to rest on the steering wheel. Why this? Why now? The last thing I needed was a wrench thrown into my carefully formulated plans, and Patton James was a mighty big wrench. There could not have been a worse person on the planet to show up today, and I seemed to have no out, no other option. Why couldn't Pat and James at least have been short, fat, and ugly? As it stood, he was going to be a major distraction with his thick, sandy blonde hair, his stupid, vibrant gray eyes, and his bulging biceps, and don't even get me started on that tight ass. I shook my head. Last thing I needed. Chapter 8. Mariah Cody looked up at me from where he stood, slicing soap loaves into individual bars before handing them off to Emily, who was shrink-wrapping them. Miss Mariah, you're stressing me out. I stopped pacing and glanced over at him. Sorry, Emily sighed. You need to find that guy and give him a piece of your mind. I could feel my entire body strung tight with anger. I want to find him and rip his head off. Cody winced. Okay, maybe just try talking to him before you dismember him? Emily scoffed. Fuck that, dismember him, I'll help. I stared out through the workroom door, surveying what was soon to be the sales floor of the shop. There were supplies piled up, but not a lot of work had been completed. Three days. For three days now, Patton had shown up around noon, worked for two or three hours, and left for the day. Today, he had barely stuck around for 30 minutes before leaving. No explanation, no excuse, he just left. The entire time he was here, the tension in the air was so thick it was hard to breathe. But tension and awkwardness aside, he had a job to do and I had a grand opening that was getting nearer every day. The only positive thing about feeling like a rubber band stretched so taut it might snap at any moment was that it caused me to work like a maniac. I'd gotten more products made in three days than I normally did in a week. I worked nonstop, morning, noon, and night, driving myself to exhaustion. Meanwhile, my lazy-ass contractor was probably off lying on a beach somewhere, sipping cocktails and soaking up the rays when he should be here doing his job. No matter how many times I told myself to calm down, each time my gaze fell on the unfinished cabinetry and pile of lumber, I was one step closer to snapping that damn rubber band. I was so furious that I couldn't see straight. That's it. I'm going to go find that man and drag his sorry butt back here to do his job. He needs to know that this cavalier attitude is not gonna fly with me. Uh-uh, no siree. I yanked my apron over my head and tossed it in the laundry hamper by the door. I'll be back. Do you need me to tag along for backup? Cody started to pull his apron off too, but I held up my hand. Nope, this is my problem. I should have done more research. I should never have listened to Parker. Groaning, I grabbed my purse and stormed out. I didn't know where Patton was, but I'd been exposed to his scent way more than was comfortable. It was burned into my memory, and I was confident that, in bird form, I'd be able to track him. As a parrot shifter, I had an exceptional olfactory scent, a quality that also helped with fragrance blending of my products. Hunting out scents was a particular skill of mine. I bet I could have found that good for nothing if he'd hopped on a plane and flown to Bermuda. I drove to my house on Bluefin Boulevard, parked on the street, and ran inside. After opening the large window in the back, I stripped down to my birthday suit before shifting and taking flight through the window and into the clear Florida sky. Patton's scent was almost immediately recognizable once I got near the shop and I easily followed his trail. I may have been seething, but my stupid bird was eager to see her mate. She hadn't nearly gotten enough of him and didn't care how miserable the man made me. She was enamored and longed to connect with his bear. I swore, stupid bird falling all over a grizzly bear. That made no sense. 
I spotted Patton out in the water on a boat, lounging on the deck. He was kicked back, taking in some sun and drinking a beer like he hadn't a care in the world. The boat was far enough out to sea that I could shift without worrying that anyone on shore might see or hear, since I intended to murder the life out of him. Swooping down in a dive, I gave him a hearty flick with my wing, smacking him in the face before landing on the front of the boat and shifting back. The second I had a mouth rather than a beak, I used it to yell at him. What in the ever-loving hell are you doing out here sunning yourself? Patton took being surprise attacked by an oversized parrot better than most men, I'd guess. His beer flew out of his hand, he sank into a defensive crouch, and he all but climbed under his chair for cover until he saw me standing there hollering, at which point he stood up straight in more ways than one. He was rubbing the side of his face where I'd given him a good wing whack. That kind of hurt. I avoided looking at his growing erection or at the rows of ab muscles in the eight-pack he was sporting, both of which screamed like hell to be looked at. Good. I hope it did. I want to wring your neck, you fool. I have so much riding on this grand opening. You're supposed to be working on my shop, and instead you're out on a boat working on your tan? Meanwhile, I'm staring at piles of lumber and supplies sitting idly on my shop floor while I worry myself silly. He merely stood gaping at me. Well, say something. You're naked. I threw my arms up. Yes, yes I am, because I had to shift to come hunt you down. For the past several days, you've been working, and I use that term loosely, for less than two hours a day and then blowing me off. He stepped closer to me, his gaze traveling up and down my body, his gray eyes glowing silver. Don't say blowing right now. My shifter senses screamed predator moments before I spotted a man emerging from below deck. My bird tensed at the scent of a feline. Before I could calm her down, Patton became a growling Neanderthal. Back inside, don't you fucking look at her. He snarled at the other man, and I watched his claws jutted out, extending from his fingertips, and fur sprouted along his arms. I'm not fucking around here, Dylan. I will take you down. Dylan stole a quick glance my way, smirked, then threw his hands up in surrender before turning and going back to the cabin below deck. Patton turned his snarly face toward me and stepped even closer. I wasn't done bitching him out, though. Let me tell you what this shop is to me. I spent the first 17 years of my life living in a shack with no running water in a backwater swamp so far from civilized society the only things that would venture back to my childhood home were gators, snakes, leeches, and my drunk mama. And there were plenty of all of those. Except mama. I spent 17 years eating catfish and muskrat for supper, praying, plotting, preparing, and planning to get the hell out of that stinking mud hole. I sold whatever I could find to make enough money to feed myself and my mama on those rare occasions when she was between binges and actually came home. I have grown my business from nothing. I worked my ass off to climb out of abject poverty, the whole time with one goal, my eyes on one prize, my own boutique to sell my creations. I've spent more lonely nights than I can count working my fingers to the bone for this. It's my dream. It's my baby. It's what separates me from my past, and if it fails, I have no safety net to fall down on, no family construction business, no brother to bail me out, no caring parents to go home to, nothing. This shop is my everything. It's my proof to myself that I'm somebody. Not that dirty, skinny, little ragamuffin from a rundown shack in the bayou that no one ever expected to amount to much. All I'm asking from you is to do the job I hired you for. I hate to say this, but I need you. I called around. There really is no one else. Frozen, he appeared speechless. I marched closer to him and punched him as hard as I could in the arm twice. 
I knew it probably felt like a tap to a bear shifter, but I was beyond fuming. I wanted him to feel even a little bit of what I was feeling. And here you are, sunbathing while I spend the day alternating between chewing my nails from the anxiety and pulling my hair out from the stress. You said you'd do this job, so fucking do it. I'm doing it. I sucked in a deep breath and clutched his hand, ignoring the warm, tingling sensations coursing up my arm. That wasn't easy, but I did it. Please, Patton, I'm begging you. Don't fuck this up. Jake promised you could do this. I, with a sharp tug, he'd yanked me into his chest. That was when the fact that I was stark naked really sank in, when I felt his sun-warmed chest against my pebbling nipples. Growling, he glared down at me. Not a good time to say another man's name, woman. I inhaled sharply and, desperate to get away, shifted into my bird. With one more smack of my wide wing to his head, I flew back home. I hoped that I'd gotten through to him enough to make him take this job seriously. If he didn't, I wasn't sure what I'd do. Chapter 9 Patton the moment Mariah flew away, Dylan came back up on deck with a wide grin, acting like I hadn't almost just threatened to rip his limbs from his torso. So I take it the lovely bird's your mate. I growled and all but fell into my chair. I didn't want to fucking talk about it. I was angry at myself, at the situation, at Dylan, Jake, and any male who'd ever looked at Mariah. No matter how much I didn't want the bullshit of having a mate, I couldn't help how crazed I felt at seeing her gorgeous naked body, her mahogany skin, her dark curly hair, above and below. I'd gone from fighting the natural urges to bend her over and sink my canines and my cock into her, to wanting to murder my oldest friend for looking at her. My bear was desperate for her to carry our scent through the claiming mark. She was ours. Huh. It's not often I see you at a loss for words. Dylan sat next to me and laughed. I mean, you can't deny that it's hilarious. There was nothing hilarious about it. I wanted to break stuff, lots of stuff, and Dylan's face seemed like a convenient thing to start with. Fuck off. So what's the deal? I'm assuming she's the latest client and she's not very happy with your performance. I growled. She's not happy with anything. Because you're not a willing mate? I scoffed. She's not a willing mate. She's the one who told me that she wasn't looking for a mate. Said she's too busy. Which is great. Fucking fine. Love that for me. I don't want a damn mate either. It's a whole bunch of tedious responsibilities and it changes people. One minute you're living it up, enjoying life. The next you're flying to bum fuck wherever because some rando woman gets a new hip. She rejected you? It was mutual. Although it didn't feel mutual at that moment. That's ignorant. You can't just ignore your mate. You're telling me that you just run to your mate with open arms? He snorted. That's different. Lions aren't monogamous. We don't settle down. Bullshit. Look at my family, man. No one has an actual mate. They just fuck around and play the field all the time, or when they do settle, they're polygamous. My dad has six wives, big dramas, big messes, no mates. He gazed out at the water. Not that I have a problem with any of that. Brittany keeps pressuring me, and uh, maybe eventually we'll make it more official, but she's not my mate. Neither is Ashley or any of the others. I like being single. Exactly. But you do have a mate, and the two of you found each other. Biology is bound to take over. You need your mate, and she needs you. I ignored my bear and shook my head. Nah, the thing about mates is that there's only ever the one. She doesn't want me right now. I don't want her right now. Maybe shit will change in a decade or so. She'll still be my mate when I'm finished enjoying my life. Wow. I repositioned myself to get comfortable, but no matter what I did, I couldn't settle. What? You're a dick. And dumb as fuck if you think a woman who looks like that is gonna wait around for your dumb ass? She's hot. I especially like her thick thighs, and... I was standing over him, snarling in his face before I even realized what I was doing. 
Dylan, of course, was busy laughing at me. In my highly agitated state, I effortlessly grabbed hold of him, wrestled him up, and ended up tossing him over the side of the boat. I watched him break the surface with an angry scowl, swim to the side, and hoist himself up and out of the water. I'd hoped that throwing him overboard would allow me to let off steam and make me feel better, but it didn't. I trekked into the control room and prepared to turn the boat around and head to shore. It looked like I was going to be docked for the next week or so. I should fucking kill you. Dylan dripped seawater as he glared at me from the doorway. Since I can see you're freaked out about this whole mate thing, I suppose I'll give you some leeway and not maul you to ribbons, yet. I grumbled and griped the entire way back to shore. I was fucked. There was no way around it. I'd been intentionally doing only what I absolutely needed to do every day to keep the job on schedule and not subject myself to any more tension than was necessary. Every time I was in the same building as Mariah, the sexual tension was so thick I could cut it with a knife. What she didn't realize was that I knew exactly how much work I needed to complete each day, and there was plenty of time for the job to finish up on time. I knew that I was right on schedule. I also knew it was hard as hell to watch Mariah strut around the shop in her holy jeans or those leggings she sometimes wore stretched tightly over her round ass. Not to mention the fact that I had to watch the kid who worked for her follow along behind her like a puppy dog and the delivery men flirt and drool all over her. She was oblivious to it all. She didn't even seem to notice the effect she had on the men around her, but I did. Seeing those assholes lusting after her drove me crazy. Still, the way she yelled at me, those things she said, hearing what she said about how important the shop was to her and why, had been a real eye-opener. I wanted to know more about her, her past, that backwater shack she talked about, but mostly, I wanted to watch her succeed. I would prove to her I was not the enemy I was on her side. And she begged. I knew her well enough to know that had not been easy for her. She was a proud woman. I sure as hell was not going to let her pleas fall on deaf ears. No way I would let her down. So instead of hiding out here on the boat, I was going to put myself right in the middle of a highly uncomfortable situation and try to forget what she looked like naked. Impossible. I docked on the east side of the island, and as Dylan went off to do his thing, I spent some time thinking. I was about to be working in a too small space with a woman I not only thought was incredibly beautiful, but the more I was around her, I grew to admire her. She had moxie. I just needed to finish the job and get the fuck away. Jake would be back by then, and I'd take the boat out for a long voyage without my cell. No phone, no feline shifting buddy, nothing but me, the waves, and my guitar. Chapter 10 Mariah Patton showed up early the next morning. He had a couple of guys with him, and they worked straight through lunch and into the evening. He sent the guys home at a decent hour and then stayed late himself to continue working. I was impressed with how much he got done. I was even more impressed with the fact that, after I confronted him, he'd actually taken what I'd said seriously and was making an obvious effort. My gratitude toward him made ignoring the physical attraction between us even harder. I could smell his sunshine and salty sea aroma nonstop. I could hear him growling angrily when anyone spoke or even looked at me. His crew, Cody, even the FedEx guy elicited growls. Patton's eyes were on me all day long. I pretended not to notice, but I could feel them. I'd been interviewing prospective managers for days. Hiring a part-time manager for the shop would allow me to sneak into the back to prepare batches of product. Plus, with a manager here a few days a week, I could take a couple of days a month to travel my distribution route to deliver products to my wholesale customers as usual. The last two follow-up interviews I'd conducted had resulted in me hiring one of the candidates on the spot. His name was Johnny, and he was tall, handsome, and charming. I had a feeling he'd be an asset when it came to sweet-talking the ladies into buying. If I was being completely honest, Patton's reaction might have played a small part in my narrowing down the managerial candidates. 
It was more than obvious that Patton did not like Johnny. When Johnny touched my shoulder, casually in conversation, I watched Patton snap a hammer in two before throwing it down and walking out of the shop. He came back ten minutes later, and if menacing glares could kill, Johnny would be six feet under. The next morning, Patton continued his newly turned leaf by arriving before I did. He was already there, working on building shelves when I walked into the shop. Wearing only thick denim work pants, work boots, and a white tank top, he had bits of sawdust sticking to his sweaty, muscular shoulders and biceps. His skin was deeply tanned and his hair was windswept with blonde streaks from the sun. He was so masculine and sexy, I nearly stumbled over my feet as I fought the needy ache that engulfed me. I mumbled a hello and made a beeline straight to the workroom in the back. I'd have to spend most of my day back there, out of the direct path of temptation. I could not give in, could not, would not. I had a life plan and it didn't include Patton, at least not in the next five to ten years. The day passed in a blur of mixing soap batches, pouring the raw liquid into molds to harden, organizing the workroom and training Cody, Emily, and Johnny. Cody and Emily worked endlessly on making bath bombs, slicing logs of hardened soap into bars, shrink wrapping and labeling products. I did my best to hide out in the workroom, but there were times I had to go out front. When I did, it was clear that the sexual tension between us wasn't lessening any. Every look he sent me was so heated I practically melted. I knew he could smell my arousal and it wasn't fair that I couldn't hide that. I hoped he realized that it was, after all, just biology. When late afternoon rolled around, Johnny left early and Patton sent his workers home. Emily and Cody finished up and then took off mentioning something about plans to get together with October, a stylist at Jammy Salon, and a couple of other friends. That left just Patton and me, alone on a Friday night in a building that felt way too small for the two of us. I hid in my office, working on mixing specialty fragrances. I told myself not to do it, yet despite my warnings, I found myself inhaling deeply and reaching for the scents that I thought might in specific concentrations meld to become that particular blend of sunshine, salty sea air, and hot maleness that had been pummeling my senses for days. A little of this, a little of that, I moaned as I inhaled my concoction. I needed to go home. I definitely needed distance from Patton. Sitting in a room only a few yards away from him, recreating his scent and getting off on it, was deranged. There was a light tap on the door before it swung open and Patton appeared. He leaned against the doorframe all sexy-like. His blue-gray eyes scanned the little bottle spread out before me, and he arched a brow. A little light potion-making before bed? I smiled despite myself. I was blending fragrances. It's a side thing I do for mates on the island. Yeah? He moved closer and inspected the bottles. He picked up cinnamon and sniffed it before putting it back down and looking over the rest of them. People bring their mates to me, and I recreate their scent and bottle it, male or female. If their mate needs to take a work trip or they're separated for whatever reason, they have my formulated scent to ward off some of the lonely ache. His eyes met mine, and he lifted a bottle to his nose. Close. Not quite, though. I looked at the bottle he held and tilted my head. Lemon? A slow grin twisted his lips, and he nodded. Needs a little something sweet, uh, sweet and citrusy. I swallowed too loudly and buried my hands in my lap. What's this one? He reached for the bottle I'd been working on and grinned when I tried to snatch it away from him. As he held it away from me, my cheeks heated and he laughed. What's with the shyness, Mariah? I flashed my stern look. Put it down. Who is this supposed to smell like? He started to open it, and I jumped up, uncertain whether he'd be able to recognize his own scent in the bottle. The last thing I wanted was for him to know that I'd been in here thinking about him. When I reached for it, he held it over his head and turned away from me. 
I tried to grab it, reaching up and jumping. I was mortified he might think I'd been in here, pining away for him, even if maybe I had been. Just a little. He turned to face me and moaned when I jumped against him to try to reach the bottle, and my body rubbed against his. His eyes burned brighter and his arms snapped around my waist, holding me in place against his hard, warm body. I instantly forgot about the bottle until he asked again about it. Who's it smell like, pretty bird? My hands on his chest, I told myself to push him away. Instead, I flattened them over his muscles and copped a feel. No one. He lowered the bottle and smelled it before dropping it onto my desk and growling. Smells like a man. Who? What man are you in here smelling? His growl made my knees weak, causing my body to lean against him even more. His large hand cupped the back of my head and forced my face to turn up. I could see his bear in his eyes. The wildness was clear in his snarl. He ran his nose over my cheek and then my neck. Sniffing into my hair, he held me more tightly as he searched for some imaginary male's scent. His search turned into something else when he changed tactics and ran his tongue over the base of my throat. I moaned and he snapped his head up, his eyes burning as they met mine. Don't do that, woman. I bit my lip and dug my fingers into his arms as he lowered his face and lightly nipped my neck. Dragging his teeth along my shoulder, I fought for control. But when his tongue shot out and he sucked on the tender flesh under my ear, I lost it. I was helpless to stop the moan that tore from my lips. Patton sucked harder, then slid his lips higher. My jaw, my cheek, the corner of my mouth. His breathing was labored. Tell me to fucking stop. Tell me to go away. Say the words right now, Mariah. I couldn't think, couldn't make sense of anything except how good he felt against me. I looked up at him with heavy lids, chasing the high that he gave me like a junkie chased their next fix. Don't stop. Before I'd finished the sentence, he'd captured my mouth in a bruising kiss. Desperate, needy, it was full of raw hunger and burning need. His hand gripped my neck as he stroked my tongue with his. He tasted like a rainstorm. Desire blossomed in my core, leaving me smiling against his lips. Patton's large hand slid down to cup my ass, and my smile faded into moans of pure craving. I had to have him. I couldn't go on without it. Like oxygen, I felt as though I'd die if I couldn't breathe him in right then and there. Consequences be damned, the only thing I could think about was Patton. Chapter 11, Patton I lifted Mariah into my arms and carried her until her back hit the wall behind her. Pinning her there, I ran my hand over her thigh and then up her torso until it reached her chest. Cupping her breast, my thumb stroked her nipple, feeling it harden under my hand. Kissing, tasting, and nibbling across her jaw, I continued down and sucked the delicate skin of her neck, pleased at the dark marks my mouth left. Her moans encouraged me, and I wanted to leave marks on every part of her. Her legs were wrapped around me, her back to the wall. As I pressed against her more tightly, she tilted her hips, gasping when our bodies lined up perfectly. My erection, trying to burst through my denim work pants, dug into her hot core. Her fingers tangled in my hair, tugging as I rocked my hips into her. Patton. I leaned my upper body back and pulled her shirt over her head. She reached for mine and kept tugging at it until she finally got it off and tossed it to the side. I trailed my mouth across her collarbone and over her chest, nipping the top of her breasts. The white bra she wore was innocent as hell, but the breasts spilling out over the top of it were anything but. Dark brown, with a golden undertone, her skin was smooth as silk, and as I tugged down her bra to expose the dusky nipples hidden beneath, a moan rose from my throat. They were the sexiest thing I'd ever seen. Cupping her breasts, massaging them, I kissed her swollen lips. Her fingers dug into my shoulders, her blunt fingernails bit into my skin. 
Her hips worked feverishly against mine, drawing me further into the lust-filled haze that enveloped us. I broke the kiss and leaned my head back, watching her. Mouth parted, lids lowered, breathing heavily. She moaned and then shuddered as her body trembled against mine. Her first orgasm was fuel to my fire. I needed more. I wanted to watch all her orgasms, every one she'd ever have from here on out. I wanted everything. Her eyes were heavy as they opened and found me watching. She bit her lip. More. I adjusted her body so I could unhook her bra and drag it down her arms. She leaned forward and kissed my throat, scraping her teeth across my flesh until I could barely hold on to the little control I had left. Spinning us around, I sat her on to the only corner of her desk not covered with jars and bottles and reached between us to cup her sex. Her back arched, pressing her full breasts into my chest. Patton, please. I slid her forward onto her feet and knelt in front of her. Grabbing the waistband of her leggings, I yanked them down to her knees. Her pale pink panties were useless as I tried to drag them down. The material gave way and I tossed them away before burying my face between her thighs. Oh, God. She stumbled, leaning back and catching herself on her desk. I spun her hips around and bent her over with a hand on her lower back so I could devour her from behind. The angle let me slip my tongue into her and fuck her with it. I rubbed her clit, growling as I tasted her sweet juices. I was like a starving man devouring her. When I thrust two fingers into her tight center, I leaned back, watching as she worked her hips back and forth on my fingers. I slapped her ass cheek, needing to see the jiggle of her plump bottom. I wasn't disappointed. Mariah's moan urged me on, and I did it again on her other cheek. Working another finger into her, I slapped her ass, gently, again and again, watching it shake as she edged near another orgasm. Come for me, pretty bird. Come on my fingers. She responded immediately, her core tightening around my fingers, the muscles squeezing and releasing as she cried out her pleasure. I stood up and used my other hand to free myself from my jeans. In a swift move, I slid my fingers out and thrust my cock in while she was spasming. Her scream of pleasure had my balls tightening too fast. I couldn't slow down, though. Her body gripped my shaft so tightly, so perfectly, that I didn't think I'd ever pull out again. I wanted to live right there in her forever. I reached around her. Her hands gripped the desk, and I locked my fingers over hers as I pulled out slightly, then sank home again. Her hair was wild. The scent of her arousal in the air was the sweetest perfume I'd ever experienced as I worked my pelvis back and forth, hard and fast. Her moans and broken cries spurred me, the way she shouted my name like a plea for pleasure. Back and forth, I filled her over and over. I wanted to look at her face as we orgasmed together. I let go of one of her hands to cup her chin and turn her face to mine. Her eyes fluttered, her lip caught between her teeth. Seeing her like that, in the throes of passion, was my undoing. My muscles tightened until I felt like I'd snap. I was right on the edge. I kept my eyes on my mate's face as another orgasm started for her. She inhaled a shaky breath and whispered my name. Those ebony eyes opened and focused on mine for a brief second. Everything in me told me to sink my canines into her neck and leave my claiming mark on her tender flesh. The hickeys weren't enough. I wanted to leave a permanent mark, one that wouldn't fade, one that told the world she was mine. As her body milked my cock, it wasn't easy to hold myself back and keep my teeth off her. Her hand snapped up and her fingers dug into my arm. Patton, yes. I buried my face in the crook of her neck and fought my instincts to clamp my teeth down as the strongest orgasm I'd ever had shot through me. Holding her against me as we both reached climax, I marked her in a different way. Shaking, exhausted, and spent, I groaned as I slipped out, already missing her. Now what? I was fighting within myself, desperately trying to hold on to my freedom, yet the soft curve of her back was tantalizing. I ran my fingers over her back and stroked my thumb over a tattoo on her spine at the base of her neck. A small cluster of whimsical soap bubbles. 
I couldn't stop from leaning forward and blowing over them. Mariah remained bent over the desk and shivered under me as I continued to gently caress her. She stroked her fingers up the arm I was bracing myself with. Her heartbeat was slowing. I could feel it through her back. Don't move. I kissed her bubble tattoo and somewhat reluctantly stepped away. Assuming no one would be looking through the front window into the store, I went out and grabbed a clean towel and a bottle of water. I poured a little water out on the towel as I returned to the workroom and smiled when I saw that she'd listened. Still resting her upper body over her desk, she was a work of art. The kind of beauty that inspires painters and sculptors to create great works that are marveled at throughout centuries. I slipped the towel between her legs and gently cleaned her before pulling her leggings back up. I put my own clothes on before finding her shirt and helping her into it. She kept her eyes down. I need to straighten up in here. I looked around. I'll help you. No, no, uh, it's a, uh, I'm okay, I've got it. She flashed a tight smile, one that was clearly forced and settled into her desk chair. Her wince as she sat made me feel a little guilty. Maybe I'd been a bit too rough. She certainly hadn't complained, but I probably should have been gentler. I wanted to stay and help, but I wasn't sure that was appropriate. I didn't seem to be welcome anymore, and we'd both been clear about our intentions from the start. We'd agreed. We weren't going to do the mate thing, not yet anyway. I took a step back and shoved my hands into my pockets to keep from reaching out to her. I, uh, guess I'll go. Yeah, okay, uh, cool. She didn't look up. Thanks. I let out a frustrated sigh, turned and walked away, not at all sure whether I was doing the right thing. Chapter 12, Mariah. Patton showed up the next morning and got straight to work. His crew wasn't with him, but that didn't appear to slow his progress. It was impossible not to watch his muscles ripple as he moved around the shop, lifting things that would have been too heavy for a normal man. He was dirty, sweaty, and I was too far gone to keep my mind from wandering to thoughts about the way his kisses tasted. I stole glances at him when he wasn't paying attention and lost myself in daydreams, reliving what we'd done. He'd given me the most amazing, most intense, and most mind-altering orgasms of my life. He had left me sore and spent, yet longing for more. The whole thing had also been a big mistake, huge. After experiencing that and with him so close by, couldn't focus on anything else. Around noon, Cody came in and helped me in the back. He didn't normally work weekends, but I'd asked him to stop by to help me rearrange a few pieces of equipment into a more manageable configuration. If he noticed that I wasn't as focused, he didn't say anything. He did, however, crack jokes and kept me smiling, which was a welcome distraction. Despite the age gap between Cody and me, we got along pretty well. I kept hearing growls coming from the main room, but I didn't put two and two together at first. I was so distracted by the effect the growls had on my body that I didn't connect them to the fact they occurred every time I laughed at something Cody said. Low and menacing, Patton's growl was the kind that I would have avoided in the wild. It would have made me shift and get the hell out of Dodge before feathers went flying. Cody didn't seem to notice the warning, though. Not that he would have, he wasn't a shifter, and he wasn't doing or saying anything inappropriate. He was acting like any friendly employee might act toward a friendly employer. Realizing Patton was emitting a possessive warning growl sent a flurry of butterflies fluttering through my belly. No matter how much I tried to fight it or deny it, I kind of liked it. It wasn't until Cody gave me a quick hug goodbye at the front door that I suddenly wondered if he'd known what was going on all along and was intentionally provoking it. Huh. I had a strange feeling that might be the case when he lingered a bit more, something he'd never done before, and winked at me. Did the boy have a death wish? 
Nervous for him, I shoved him out the door, locked it, and waved goodbye through the glass. When I turned, Patton was standing, arms crossed over his chest, mean mugging Cody, as the kid grinned and slowly began walking down the sidewalk. Never realized employees were supposed to hug their bosses goodbye. I bit my lip to fight a giggle. I guess you'll need to talk to some of your crew and see if you can make that happen. Growling again, he ran his hands through his hair. What are you doing tomorrow? I frowned. Working here, that's pretty much my daily plan for the next ten years. He scoffed. Well, that's exactly why I'm going to make my next point. I think you could use a day off. You're too high strung and stressed. You need to relax. Frowning more deeply, I crossed my arms under my chest and ignored the way his eyes raked over my breasts. I shook my head. Is it customary for contractors to insult their clients' work ethic? Patton's growl was deeper than ever. We both know we're not just a contractor and his client. No, we don't, because we agreed that's all it would be. And then I bent you over your desk and fucked you until you screamed my name. He swore and held up his hands. Sorry, forget I said that. I didn't mean for that to go there. Forget he said that? I was too busy blushing to respond. I'm not trying to invite you out on a date. I just think you need to relax. You could come out on the boat with me and have a day of relaxation instead of stressing about everything, and you'd actually be invited this time. It felt like a trap. Couldn't hide my suspicion. Why? Because, he shrugged. I figure in 20 years or so, when you're done conquering the world of bath and body care and I'm tired of living the life of a carefree bachelor, we'll come back together. The least I could do is make some effort to ensure you reach that point in your life and don't stroke out or have a stress-related heart attack before then. I turned away from him and pretended to be fascinated by a piece of the new shelving. I was oddly moved by his invite. I hadn't thought about us maybe coming back into each other's life sometime in the future. Who knew? Maybe, just maybe, it'd be nice to have a mate waiting for me when I was older and ready to settle down. Only if he'd grown up maturity-wise by then, though. It's just a relaxing day on my boat. Stop thinking so hard, woman. It's not a marriage proposal. I growled back at him and flipped him off. Stop calling me woman. Oh my god, that again? Are you going to come or not? Not, I hesitated. Maybe, I glanced up at the ceiling for a second. I don't know, I need to think about it. I'll be leaving the dock at eight o'clock sharp. If you're there, cool. If not, whatever, I don't care, it was just an idea. He scowled once more before turning around and grabbing another plank of lumber. Every little thing with you is like pulling teeth from a chicken. That last part had been said under his breath, but I was a shifter. I'd heard it loud and clear. And it made me grin as I sauntered into the workroom in the back. I grabbed my purse and a box of products to refill the shelves at Jammy's. I knew she probably didn't need them yet, but I needed some distance from Patton. And my desk and the lingering scent of our copulation from the night before that I couldn't seem to rid my office of no matter how many scented candles I burned. I've got deliveries. Why didn't you let that little boy handle them? You're kind of a dick, you know that? He shrugged like it was nothing. Yeah, I hear it all the time. I shook my head and hurried out the door, desperate for fresh air and space. Driving down to Jammy's, I took a second in the car to try and calm my nerves before getting out and heading inside. Ellen was at her desk, eyes bright, and she flashed her dimpled grin when she spotted me. Oh, Mariah! You're a sight for sore eyes. I gave my notoriously difficult-to-please mother a few of your things, and she's hooked. I swear, you're a genius. I laughed and put the box on her desk. That's fantastic. I'll happily grab a few samples and put together a small bag for her. Bless you. You're also an angel, a genius angel. Aunt Kitty waved me over to her station. She was doing some intricate cornrows and had both hands full. The woman in her chair looked like she was in the middle of spilling some juicy beans, so I didn't want to interrupt. 
I left the box with Ellen to replenish the stock as she saw fit, and silently sat in Layla's empty chair next to Aunt Kitty. And then? He actually told me that he thought we should see other people. Can you believe the nerve of that man? Well, Donna, you did tell him that you wanted to have a threesome with his brother. Aunt Kitty was clearly holding back a laugh. It was just an idea, Donna grunted and then spotted me. Oh, Mariah Star, I've been meaning to tell you. I got some of that massage oil of yours, used it on Jimmy's brother, and my God, girl, that stuff is amazing. I had that man wrapped around my little finger so tightly he couldn't have gotten away from me if a SEAL team tried to rescue him. Aunt Kitty snorted and then laughed so loudly that every head in the place turned to us. If he'd brought a SEAL team in to help, I'm sure they wouldn't be getting away either, you old floozy. I smiled at their exchange. Any other day, I might have been laughing along, but I was stressed. Of course, Jammy noticed. What's got your muff in a huff? I gave a snort of my own. My muff is not in a huff. Our exchange drew Aunt Kitty's gaze, her eyes narrowed. Did someone fluff your muff? At my sharp inhale of breath, Aunt Kitty screamed and threw her hands up in a cheer. Her scream was so loud, Margie's coloring brush went flying, and she had to chase it as it glided across the floor. When it slid under a cabinet, she got down on her belly to fish it out with a broom handle. Grabbing a hold of it, she tossed it into the sink before ignoring her client to come over and examine me more closely. Someone say something about your muffin getting a fluffin', honey? You've been receiving a little behind-the-scenes action? She waggled her brows. These women were clearly out of their minds. Shaking my head, I stood up and pretended to be interested in anything else. I just came to drop refills off. I need to get back. Aunt Kitty stomped her feet and she pointed to the chair I'd vacated. Sit down. You and I are going to chat as soon as I get Donna finished up. Give me five minutes. When Aunt Kitty issued a command, Aunt Kitty issued a command. I planted myself in the chair and tried not to pout. How the fuck had they known? Was I that bad at keeping a poker face? Ellen peeked over her desk and winked at me. I forced a smile back and then looked around. Fern's door was shut, so I assumed she was in with a massage client. Layla wasn't in, but October was sitting in her chair, engrossed in something on her phone. Margie and Jamie were both bickering with Margie's client, the three of them arguing over whose boots they'd rather have parked under their bed, Denzel Washington or The Rock. I sat there, sighing heavily and wondering what I was going to say to Aunt Kitty and what she was going to say to me. All right, you. Walk with me. I have 20 minutes before my next appointment. Aunt Kitty took my arm and pulled me out of the salon with her. Once we were outside, she frowned. What's going on with you? I gulped. Nothing. She scowled and her fists dug into her ample hips. Bullshit. Talk to your auntie. Swearing, I ran my hands through my hair and gasped when Kitty knocked my hands away and inspected my neck. Oh, my word, someone did fluff your muff. She grabbed my shoulders and lightly shook me. I'm so thrilled for you. I wasn't exactly sure what she'd spotted, but I figured it was one of the many sucker bites Patton had left on me. Not a real mark, but his territorial version without the commitment. I was a little slower to heal than some of the other species of shifters. Faster than a non-shifter, but the marks were clearly still hanging around. Aunt Kitty's eyes narrowed suspiciously. Why do you seem so down? I chewed on my lip and groaned. He invited me on his boat. She hesitated. When I didn't say more, she slapped my arm. What the hell, Mariah? That's not a bad thing. We agreed it wasn't going to be like that. No strings attached. My face heated. There's something there between us, but I don't want to explore it. I don't. Bubbles Boutique is too important to me. I am not blowing up my life for a man, no matter what. I refuse. 
Besides, he's, well, he's kind of immature. Oh, Mariah. The way she said it left me feeling like she was both disappointed and sympathetic, like I just revealed a great flaw in my character. What? Honey, you're not a machine. You can't carry on like you don't need human interaction. A happy, fruitful life has balance. I interact with you. Sadly, that was my only defense. Aunt Kitty was probably the only person I made an effort to keep in my life in any substantial way. I'm an old woman. You need to live a little, sweet girl. I know for a fact that Megan and Parker tried to get you to hang out with them and you turned them down. She sighed. All work and no play leads to burnout. Pulling myself up to my full height, I frowned. I work to support myself. I have to take care of my business. She pursed her lips and raised her brows. Is that what you call it? You eat, sleep, and breathe your business from the moment you wake up until your head hits the pillow at night. From what I hear, there are plenty of things you could delegate to Cody or Emily. I hear Cody's mom, Cynthia, talking all the time about how much Cody enjoys working for you, but he wishes you'd lay more responsibility on him. I breathed a heavy sigh and rolled my head back on my neck. I don't know that they're ready. Honey, I know you have a hard time with trust, and I know why. Lord knows I don't blame you, but I don't like it either. I wish I would have been in your life when you were a little girl to protect you from all the struggles you went through. No child should ever have to endure what you have, baby. But I'm here now, and you may not like what I have to say, but for your sake, I'm going to speak my mind. It's what they call tough love. This pattern of distrust and keeping everyone at arm's length you've got going on, it will only end up hurting you, and you don't deserve any more pain. Here, on this island, there are some really amazing women. Women your age who want to hang out with you and be your friend. Aunt Kitty patted my cheek. And why wouldn't they? You're amazing, but you're working yourself into a lonely life, one you don't deserve. I worry about you. I... I wanted to argue, but she was right. I didn't really trust anyone, and I did isolate myself. When you grew up the way I'd grown up, and had to fight for everything, including the clothes on your back and the food on your table, it wasn't easy to stop fighting and let go. Please, Mariah, for me, take the day off tomorrow. Take this guy up on his offer. Make an old lady happy and just for one day give yourself a break. If you don't, you're going to suffer burnout. There's more to life than working 24-7. Let yourself relax for just one day. There was that word again, relax. I scowled at Aunt Kitty and my defenses rose. You hardly take a day off. She grinned and patted my cheek. When you have as much fun as I do here, you don't have to take a day off. Besides, Jammy and Margie are my two closest friends. Those crazy bitches are a blast. I snorted, her candor catching me completely off guard. Now, go. Finish what you need to do tonight so you can take tomorrow for yourself. I groaned. I don't know. One day, that's all I ask. One day won't be detrimental to your business. I sighed and kissed her cheek before heading back to my car. I had a feeling that might not be true. Chapter 13, Patton If she'd been any other woman, I would have been sure she was toying with me, playing hard to get. With Mariah, though, it wasn't a game. When she didn't show up at eight... I told myself to leave, and again, I would have if it had been any other woman. But I waited. 8.15 came and went, then 8.30. At 8.38, Mariah appeared, hesitantly walking down the dock toward Castaway. 
Her steps were slow, like there were weights attached to her ankles. I was stupid happy that she'd shown, but I fought to keep the grin off my face. You're late, she frowned. I couldn't decide if I was coming or not. You waited. Thanks. I thought about lying and saying that I hadn't been waiting for her, but I remembered what Dylan said about a woman like Mariah not needing a dumbass like me and figured maybe I should keep my mouth shut. I reached out to take her hand and help her aboard. The contact sent sizzles straight to my dick, but I ignored it. Get comfortable. It'll take us about 40 minutes to get to this little cove I know. She looked around and finally settled on my beach chair. Pulling her knees up to her chest, she looked nervous. I struggled to think of something to say to calm her nerves, but I didn't know what. I didn't know what I was doing. My brain was telling me to stay away from her, or I was going to get sucked in, just like every other poor sucker who stumbled across his mate. But my bear was screaming at me to close the distance between us. I had overwhelming feelings for the woman who seemed nervous about taking a day off, or maybe she was nervous about spending that day off with me. I watched her as I took the boat out of its slip and steered it south. She sat stiffly in the chair, her shoulders tight. She was dressed in a light gauzy dress, the straps of a bikini showing from underneath, and I wondered if I could get her to loosen up enough to lose the dress. Halfway to the little cove where I like to fish, she stood, walked to the front of the boat, shook her arms out, and turned to me. I was watching her intently. She smiled timidly and took a step closer. Thank you for inviting me today. I'm really glad you came. She swallowed loudly as she looked away from me. So what's the plan? I shrugged. I figured I'd start by taking you to the cove. It's one of my favorite places. Then we could play it by ear, swimming, lounging in the sun, fishing, grilling lunch if we catch anything. We could have a few beers. I reached out and tapped the bun atop her head with a finger. Just a relaxing, no stress allowed day. With a great sigh, she looked back at me over her shoulder. I'm not sure I know how to relax. Well, you're in luck. I'm the local expert. I'll show you all my secrets. I winked. Before you know it, you'll be strolling into work at noon and blowing off whole weekdays to go fishing. She threw her head back and laughed. <laughs> nope. I grinned in return. I couldn't help it. It was a thrilling experience to see her laugh. She had a dazzling smile that lit up her entire face. Yeah, that was overreaching a bit, huh? She bit her lip and blew out a breath that fluttered a piece of her curly hair that had escaped her bun. I don't know when I took a day off last. This year? When she shook her head, I frowned. Last year? Longer. I grabbed her shoulders and playfully shook her, ignoring the urge to pull her to my chest. Woman, how have you not ended up in the hospital? How's your blood pressure? Her eyes flared, and instead of chewing my ass out, she went along with my playful mood like I had hoped she would. What is it with you and calling me woman? Although she pretended to be irritated, she wore a slight grin. I couldn't resist any longer. I chanced ruining the mood by pulling her closer. I like watching the fire burn in your eyes when you look at me. What can I say? I'm a sadistic son of a bitch. Her breath hitched and she trembled ever so slightly. I wondered if she was remembering the incredible passion we shared in her office. I was. She cleared her throat. How much longer until we get to the cove? Twenty minutes. I'm going to stretch out and enjoy the fresh air and sunshine then. She gently pulled away from me and headed in the direction of the loungers. She paused, threw a glance over her shoulder, and graced me with a flash of a smile before turning back to the chair. My breath stuck in my chest as I watched her pull the dress over her head and drop it at her feet. She wore a teeny tiny bikini, and it was pale yellow, which set off the dark brown and golden tones of her skin. Holy, and if that wasn't enough to turn my balls blue, she bent over. While she worked at adjusting the back of the chair, my jaw hung loose and my eyes failed to blink. I was given a beautiful view of her sexy ass and mile-long legs.
She stretched out on her stomach and reached behind her to untie the string that held her top. My dick was so hard it could have steered the boat. I had to take a step back to keep the fucker from steering us into the middle of the ocean. I realized I still wasn't breathing and had to force the breath out of my lungs while I muttered a curse. Shaking my head, I vowed to do my best to get us to the cove without killing us. To my dismay, when I slowed the boat and steered into the shady recess of the small cove, Mariah tied her top back on and stood up covered. I was hoping that maybe she'd remain topless, which wasn't quite as strange for a shifter as it was for a non-shifter. I dropped anchor. You can fish either way you want, with a good old fishing pole or my preferred way, au naturel. Your choice. I prefer getting a little wet myself. She wrinkled her brow and laughed until I yanked my shirt over my head. Then, like a blushing schoolgirl, she covered her face and turned around, giggling. She peeked over her shoulder and through her fingers, just in time to see me shove my shorts down. My bare ass was on full display, and because the sound of her laughter was like a tonic to my soul, I wiggled it a little just to make her giggle again before I jumped over the side of the boat. I felt like the big man as her laughter floated over me. The water was nice and cool, but I was warm under her gaze as she peered over the side. Are you sure there are no crocodiles? I barked a laugh and flashed her a wicked grin. They'd be stupid. When she looked like she was going to ask why, I shifted into my bear, a massive grizzly right there in the water, and I roared up into the sky. With my paw, I sent a splash of water her way and got her and half the deck drenched. Then I dove under the surface. I came back up, acting like a fool, rolled onto my back, folded my front limbs behind my head with my large, furry belly exposed, and spit a stream of water out like a fountain. She watched me in fascination. Her upper half leaned over the side of the hull and her eyes moved rapidly until I spit water. Then she chuckled and her face remained stretched in a wide grin. Wow! She was clearly impressed, and my ego inflated to enormous proportions. My bear was proud. I was proud. I wanted her to come into the water, so I chuffed at her and splashed again. Mariah understood. She straightened and carefully stretched one long leg over the side before pausing. Do I just, just... I shifted back into my human form and swam closer to her. Yeah, just jump, woman. Narrowing those pretty dark eyes, she let out a holler as she jumped into the water. She came up, laughing, a few strands of her hair plastered over her eyes. With a swipe of her hand, she pushed them off her forehead. Her smile was a breathtaking sight, and she'd smiled more that morning than in all the time since I'd met her. Your bear is huge. I guess I didn't think about how big a grizzly shifter would be. You're beautiful, I scowled. Beautiful? I'm handsome, sexy, hot. I got it. Hot, sexy hunk. Yeah, that's me. I'm a hot, sexy hunk. Beautiful is hell on a man's ego, woman. It makes me sound effeminate. Hike me up one second, shoot me down the next. She splashed me and swam away. When she noticed me following her, she twisted around and glared. No chasing. I grinned and started humming the dramatic theme from Jaws. Swimming after her faster, I grabbed her foot and laughed when she giggled, shouted, and spun on me. She sent a wave of water splashing over me, but I used her foot to yank her to me. Only when I had my hands on her waist and our feet tangled as we tread water did I stop laughing. I licked my lips, and a realization struck me. I was staring into the loveliest eyes I'd ever seen, in the most beautiful face I'd ever seen, on the most beguiling woman I'd ever known. Suddenly, I struggled to remember why our mating was a bad idea. Chapter 14, Mariah I was caught up in the moment. That was my excuse. Patton's impressive grizzly, Patton's naked, well-muscled ass, Patton holding me against his chiseled physique. It was a lot for any woman to handle. 
let alone for a woman who'd gone through a mighty long sexual dry spell up until recently, when she'd had wildly spontaneous sex with the man whose chiseled physique she was pressed up against. Feeling a little uninhibited, I closed the few inches between our mouths by leaning in and kissing him. It was just a quick kiss, and before he had the chance to respond, I pulled away and swam farther out from the boat laughing. The sound of my own laughter, seeming to bubble out of nowhere, shocked me. How many times had I let out such carefree laughter since I joined Patton on the boat? I never realized how little I normally laughed until this morning. No wonder Patton and Aunt Kitty called me stressed. Patton swam after me, doing his best to catch me again. I raced away from him, enjoying the game for reasons unknown to me. When he caught me again, he lifted me and tossed me through the air. Splashing into the ocean, I came up, still laughing. I watched the way his eyes crinkled as he smiled back at me, and I moved toward him. He held his arms out for me to climb into his embrace, but instead I splashed him and swam back toward the boat. Patton caught up with me right before I reached it and pinned me to the side with his arms on either side of my head. We stared into each other's eyes, grinning. Then he lowered his mouth to my shoulder and kissed one of the sucker bites he'd given me that was still fading. I blew out a soft breath and grabbed his sides, holding on while he kissed his way up my neck. I wrapped my legs around his waist and bit my lip as the gentle waves rocked my body against his in a tantalizing way. He kissed across my jaw, the corners of my mouth, then the tip of my nose and my eyelids. Just as he brushed his lips over mine, something nipped my inner thigh. I screamed and all but climbed Patton like a ladder. Something bit me! I pulled myself onto the platform and then stood there, clutching my chest and stomach and gasping for air as I stared down at him wide-eyed. Get out! Get out! There's something in that water! Something bit my thigh, Patton! Why are you still in there? He sank under the water and I screamed, thinking something grabbed him and pulled him under. I didn't know what, a shark, a sea monster, the creature from the Black Lagoon, it could be anything. I was trying to think clearly and figure out the best way to rescue him when his head popped back above the surface. He was grinning, holding a small fish in his hand. I found the little fucker who thought he could take a nibble from my woman. My stomach clenched at his words. His woman? I almost voiced a protest, but he was laughing and it was so contagious, I just smiled back at him. You okay? I nodded. I think I'm going to forego water and stick to the air for a bit. He laughed again and swam backward away from me. Go on, I'll watch. Somehow he turned shifting into something more sensual. I reached behind me and untied my bikini top seductively before letting it slip from my fingers. His goofy grin fell and his jaw hung open. I watched his eyes grow wide as saucers when I slid the bottoms down. Standing bare in front of him, I was aware of my body in a way I'd never been before. I could feel every part of myself, every cell in me responding to his rapt attention with elation and the longing for more. It was almost painful, the ache I felt for him. Shifting, I took flight. I stretched my wings, flying higher above the water, soaring into the clouds. Keeping my keen eyes on Patton, I dove down and dragged the tip of my wing in the water, spraying him. My bird couldn't have been more overjoyed. She was finally getting to have fun and release all her pent-up energy. I hardly ever got to fly, not freely and just for fun. My parrot was in heaven. Having her mate nearby, watching us with an expression of pride and awe, was pretty cool, too. I let her fly through the salty sea air for a while, while Patton floated on his back and followed with his eyes. I had to admit, I loved the look of admiration on his face as he watched. I landed on the stern of the boat and shifted back. For some reason, I now felt exposed. I crossed my legs and held my arm across my chest, hiding my nudity as he swam closer. My heart raced and I was breathing hard from the exertion of flying, 
but seeing the look in Patton's eyes froze me to the spot. He swam up to me and planted his hands on either side of my thighs. Don't cover yourself. Your body is the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen in my life, like a work of art, like the Venus de Milo or something. Please, let me look at you today. My heart in my throat, I dropped my arm and chewed my lip. Uncrossing my legs, I felt heat course through me as he moved to stand between my legs. His eyes raked over me, devouring me. A low, pained growl came from his chest, but then he dropped back into the water and swam away. I didn't invite you so I could spend the day trying to convince you to let me fuck you. I'd love to, don't get me wrong, but I invited you because I want to see you relax, so this is me keeping my dick over here. I'm going to catch some fish for us. I watched him shift into his grizzly bear and then dive under the water. He did that again and again until he came up with a fish in each hand and one held between his teeth. Dropping them in a bucket on the back of the boat, he shifted, pulled himself up, naked as the day he was born, and strolled past me. I was having an internal conflict. My bird was telling me that spending the day having down and dirty sex was harmless and would be the most relaxing thing I could possibly do, but my heart felt too vulnerable. It might be different if he weren't my mate and I knew I could just walk away without a second thought. The mate thing made it tricky. I couldn't fall under his spell. So instead of following him in his perfectly toned ass cheeks, I pulled my dress over my head and stared out across the water. What now? He stepped into his shorts, ignoring the erection tenting them, and nodded to the fish. Now the messy part. I was no stranger to killing and cleaning fish. I'd eaten plenty of them growing up, but he motioned for me to have a seat, so I did. I watched as he did the job. He pulled out a small hibachi grill and got it going, then cleaned up the mess before seasoning the fish and tossing it on the hot grill. He ducked below deck and reemerged with a salad along with a couple of beers. I tried to help, but he just scowled at me and told me to relax. When the fish was done, he prepared me a plate, and we settled into the beach chairs with our lunch. This is delicious. I cleaned my plate and finished my beer before talking again. It's been a long time since I've had fresh fish, and you can't get fresher than this. Normally, I just eat whatever I can grab quickly, a salad, energy bar, fast food. You should take more time for yourself, doing this. I stretched out with a full stomach and droopy lids. Right now, I can't argue with you. He got up and took both our plates. When he returned, he settled in a chair next to me. He had another beer in his hand, but he just let it dangle from his fingers as he watched me. You look peaceful. I smiled. The sunshine out here feels like heaven. Scoot over here. There's more sun this way. His grin was cheeky, but I found myself standing up and moving my chair closer. His eyes heated as they dropped to my dress. Aren't you a little worried about tan lines? For some reason, I didn't ignore the dare in his voice. I wasn't light-skinned, but normally I spent little time outdoors, and there was no doubt today's sunshine was going to darken me up. I pulled the dress over my head, like I had all the confidence in the world, and settled onto my stomach in the chair. Stretching out, I turned my head to face him and raised my eyebrows. No tan lines it is. Growling, he let his head fall back and his arm fall out to the side, his fingers just barely grazing my arm. Does the amazingly talented and beautiful Mariah Starr normally take naps on a Sunday afternoon? I can't remember the last time I took a nap on a Sunday. I'm usually working. You work Sundays too? I'm normally elbows deep in oils by this time of the day. Hesitating, I groaned. That sounds way kinkier than it really is. I'm coming over next Sunday. I laughed and watched his profile as his mouth stretched into a goofy grin. His finger stroked my arm as I watched his chest rise and fall. On one hand, it felt foreign, having fun and just existing without a schedule. On the other hand, it felt incredibly natural. 
My brain had slowed from its usual warp speed, and I felt myself actually relaxing, despite the continued and ever-present sexual tension. His tongue snaked out and ran across his bottom lip, and then he turned to look at me thoughtfully. Mariah, this is the best time I've had in a really long time. Probably ever. I nodded, suddenly choked up. I looked away so he couldn't see my eyes glisten with unshed tears. <laughs> it was stupid, and maybe I was being overly emotional, but I'd never been called anyone's best time before. Chapter 15, Patton I awoke the next morning and stretched. I'd slept better than ever. As my memories returned, my lips spread into a wide smile. I turned, eager to see Mariah's beautiful face on the pillow next to me. She wasn't there. We'd fallen into bed together the night before, exhausted after a long day of playing. I could still smell her sweet, lemony scent in the air. Still smiling, I stood and strolled through the boat, hoping to find her on deck, hopefully naked, enjoying the morning sun. She wasn't there. I inhaled deep, searching for a spot where her scent was strongest, but it was more diluted up top. She was gone. My stomach clenched. My mind briefly raced with thoughts of a multitude of dangers that might have befallen her. I searched over the sides of the boat, scanned the water, prayed I wasn't going to see her body floating there. Maybe she went for a morning flight to let her beautiful multicolored bird free to fly. I knew I was grasping at straws, an acknowledgement that made my chest feel like it was draining itself hollow. I reached out farther with my senses, trying to latch onto anything, her thoughts, emotions, whatever. I felt the tiny thread of a connection that had formed between us. It twanged like a guitar string being plucked. She was fine. Mild upset was the feeling I was getting, but she was fine, which meant she'd left willingly. She was not merely circling the boat somewhere, stretching her wings. She'd chosen to leave. The irony wasn't lost on me. How many times had I woken up next to a woman wishing she'd have snuck off in the middle of the night? No one liked those awkward morning after dances around one another. I'd look at her and worry about saying the wrong thing. She'd look at me and wonder how soon I could get us back to the island. Ironic that the one and only woman I did want to wake up next to and share the morning with, hell, share the day with, was the one who'd snuck off sometime in the night. I plopped down in a deck chair and stared out at the water. We'd had the most spectacular day. Or had we? Maybe I had and she. No, she fucking did too. She had a great day. She came alive away from work. Her eyes glowed brighter, her already radiant smile amped into megawatt range. She'd had fun, I knew it, and she'd been fun. After waking from our nap, we skinny dipped and she tried to help me fish for dinner, even though being in the water still frightened her a bit. She helped me grill dinner, still naked, wearing just an old apron. I played her some music on my guitar, and we watched one of our legendary Florida Keys sunsets. We held hands and talked as we stared into the clear night sky, watching it darken and the twinkling stars emerge. She even danced with me when I asked her. Then she danced for me. The gauzy slip of a dress she'd thrown on after dinner disappeared, and her hips swayed to a slow song that I'd never be able to listen to without a boner ever again. The fact that she'd snuck out during the night without so much as a move over dickhead you're lying on my panties was a huge ego blow. Worse, it felt like straight-out rejection. It had been obvious the second I saw Mariah that she was a looker, and once I knew a little about her, I was impressed with her accomplishments. But last night, I learned that the woman was way more than I'd realized. When she was smiling and relaxed, it was like the sky opened up and sunbeams from heaven shone right down on her. She was incredible, daring, hilariously funny, and willing to rise to a challenge without a second thought. Somewhere between chasing her through the water, grilling food to feed her, and holding her in my arms as we slow danced under the moonlight to an old Barry White song, I'd forgotten that I didn't want a mate. Whatever my reasoning for protesting the idea, I now realized I'd been just plain foolish. 
Sure, Jake had changed once he made it Tilly, but if I was being honest, I was the one who didn't like the change, not him. He seemed deliriously happy. In fact, all the friends I knew who'd found their mates seemed happy. For the life of me, I couldn't remember why I'd been so resistant. I guess it was because I hadn't expected my mate to be a woman so incredible that she knocked me off my feet. And she'd flown the coop, pun intended. It was a blow to my ego, to be sure, and it made me feel like dog shit. She was enough to make me want to change my mind about mating, but evidently, I wasn't enough to change hers. Irritated and cranky, I lifted the anchor and turned the boat on a heading back to Sunkiss Key. By the time I docked, I'd worked myself into a snit. My hurt had given way to anger. When Dylan passed me on the dock, headed toward my boat, he stepped out of my way and held up his hands. Who pissed in your Cheerios? Mariah, I growled out her name, and we're about to have words. Patton, don't you? He stopped when I glared at him and backed away. Nope, uh, never mind. I jumped in my truck and sped down to her shop, whipping into the parking lot. As the truck screeched to a halt, I slid out and marched angrily toward Mariah's boutique. She must have heard my truck tires squealing because she was rushing out of the back room when I flew through the doors. With eyes wide and a frown, she took a couple of steps toward me. What in the world? Is it normal for you to share a day of fun and a night of passion with someone and then sneak off in the middle of the night like it was nothing? My voice was raised and I kind of didn't recognize it. I was speaking from a place I'd never been, using words I'd never said to anyone. Mariah's face took on a shocked expression, then morphed into something I didn't like seeing on her. Shame. What are you doing, Patton? I'm asking you a fucking question. You snuck out in the middle of the night so I didn't get the chance to say good morning, goodbye, have a nice day, or anything when I woke up. She glanced behind her, and I could see her employees poking their heads out of the back room in response to my loud voice. When she turned back to me, her face told me just how angry she was. Her arm flew out and her finger pointed to the front door. Outside, now. I followed her out and crossed my arms over my chest. I knew I was pouting like a child, but my anger was burning a hole through me, and I didn't know how to handle these strange feelings of possessiveness, jealousy, and hurt. It's fucked up that you just... She spun on me and whacked my chest with the back of her hand. When I stumbled back a step, she followed and did it again. How dare you? How dare you come into my place of business and make a scene like that? This is my shop. I am the boss here. You do not speak to me that way in my shop in front of my employees. I took another step back. Okay, okay. I held my hands up in front of me partly as a sign of surrender, partly to block the sharp finger she'd started stabbing me with. You pissed me off is all. I wanted to talk to you. I don't know how many times I have to tell you this. This boutique is my everything. It is my baby. It is my first love. It is my world. Keeping it professional is important. You coming in and hollering about us fucking is not acceptable, Patton. She ran fingers through her wild hair and shook her head. I knew yesterday was a bad idea. I just knew it. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? It means that you know the score. It was laid out clearly, and I might have confused it by what happened yesterday. We are not doing the mate thing. That means that if I crawl out of bed and leave before morning cuddles, I do not have to answer to you. It also means you don't get all butt hurt and come flying off the handle, having words with me in my place of business. I tossed my hands up and backed away. Are you really that cold-hearted? I should have apologized when I saw the pain shoot through her eyes as my words hit their mark, but I was so fucking hurt myself. How could she not care about me at all when I had all these overwhelming feelings for her? Her eyes glistened and she blinked, looking away from me. Ah, oh, fuck. I'll come back later to finish the job. I climbed into my truck and sped away, tires squealing again. 
I cut off other cars on the way out of the parking lot and ignored their angry horns blaring as I floored the accelerator. I wanted to get away from her, away from the harsh reality of her words and away from the pain in her eyes. There just wasn't anywhere far enough. Chapter 16, Mariah If I claimed not to be devastated about the cold shoulder Patton was giving me, I'd be lying. This was different than the mild hostility and bantering we'd done before. He wasn't just ignoring the strong pull of attraction and the bond that had started forming like an invisible thread between us. He was ignoring me. Completely. His eyes never once glanced my way, never once strayed to me to search for clues about my current emotion. I, on the other hand, couldn't keep my eyes off him. I tried. I played it cool, too. I pretended I didn't care, but I couldn't stop glancing over at him every few seconds, remembering how he held me close as we swayed to bury white under the stars. But my boutique came first. I tried to busy myself with training Cody, Emily, and Johnny. Mostly Johnny, since Cody and Emily were already familiar with the product. The shelves were ready to be stocked as soon as Patton finished them. I'd printed out another stack of flyers and passed them around town. I was working on hyping the grand opening through daily social media posts and both island newspapers, the Herald and the Chronicle, did short interviews with me about my grand opening. I had surplus stock of every item I would be selling, enough that even if I sold 50 of every item, I'd still be able to replenish the shelves. Since my cold process soap took a minimum of six weeks to cure, I had one wall of the storeroom stacked floor to ceiling with portable shelving units holding bars of drying soap. Everything was ready. All that was left was to panic about the opening. I'd arranged complimentary hors d'oeuvres and beverages, but I kept second-guessing my decisions. Did I need wrapped candies with the store's logo? Did I need more food, more variety? With the anxiety surrounding the upcoming grand opening, coupled with the pain I felt from Patton spurning me, I was a wreck. When I got a chance to step away from the shop, I practically shot out of there. My mind was still chewing over Patton when I walked into Jammy's salon. I knew they didn't need refills of my products. I knew it, but I went in anyway, desperate for some of Aunt Kitty's no-nonsense advice and unconditional love. Ellen jumped to her feet as soon as I walked in. I can't wait for your grand opening. I have it marked on the calendar. I also made a shopping list of all my favorite products and the ones I want to try. You must be so thrilled and excited. I forced a smile. Mm-hmm. Thrilled and excited? I should be, but I wasn't. I was sad and empty. I suddenly understood the term hollow victory. Oh, honey, Jammy spotted my slumped shoulders the minute she laid eyes on me. What's wrong? Layla and Fern were leaning against the counter at Layla's station. Parker was seated in Layla's chair. It seemed I'd picked a slow but popular time to drop by. As each of them glanced my way, their eyes widened and their carefree expressions gave way to concerned looks. Great, I was obviously wearing my emotions on my sleeve. It was probably a terrible idea to have come here. That thought was confirmed when Aunt Kitty saw me, gasped and ran over, pulling me into a tight hug whereby I fell apart. I cried into her shoulder, hunched over, because I was almost half a foot taller than she was. Next thing I knew, I was in Layla's chair with all of them surrounding me. Parker dabbed at my face with a tissue, pushing my hair back. Jesus, Layla, fix her hair. She has an important day coming up. She deserves a new style. Laughing through tears, I waved Parker away. But Layla was already coming at me with scissors. In the state I was in, I had little choice but to surrender. So I let Layla drape a cape over me and go to town on my hair while I chewed my lip contemplating what I was going to tell them, how much of it I should reveal, and what kind of spin I should put on it. Come on, child. Tonisha Warren is in my chair, and I'm blatantly ignoring her. Aunt Kitty lowered her voice. 
Not that I want to hear any more about her bunion surgery or her cousin Wilbur's gout, but it won't do to lose a regular client. Aunt Kitty squeezed my shoulder and kissed my temple. Just talk to us, honey. October was in my face, nodding. It's man trouble, isn't it? I know that look, definitely man trouble. I nodded feebly. There is a guy. That's all I got out before my throat closed on a lump that wedged itself there and I shut up to keep from embarrassing myself further. Parker groaned. Oh, no. It's not Patton, is it? I felt something with the two of you. I could have sworn I was right. It is Patton. Was. I don't know. He's your... the one? Parker looked like she was about to start doing cartwheels across the salon. She only settled down when she realized everyone was staring at her and then only slightly. Sorry, I just love matchmaking. We agreed we weren't going to allow our connection to go anywhere. We both agreed. I am far too busy for that, and I am inches away from having all my hopes and dreams come to fruition. Patton is... He's a man-child, and he doesn't want a mate. Girlfriend, I mean. He doesn't want a girlfriend. And we were handling things just fine until we slept together. He invited me for a day on his boat, and we spent the day having the most fun I'd ever had with anyone. But I left while he was still sleeping because I panicked. It was too perfect, too easy to be with him. And I can't let him take my focus away from the boutique. If I do, it'll all fall apart, I know it. He got mad. He yelled and called me, cold-hearted. Now he's still working at the shop every day, but he's straight up ignoring me. What does he want from me? He knows this is the most important time of my life. I was upfront about that from day one. I just feel sick inside. Aunt Kitty wrapped her arms around my shoulders, narrowly avoiding the pointy end of Layla's shears. Oh, honey. It was fine before we spent the day together. It was okay that we weren't going to do the whole dating thing. Neither of us wanted it. Now, I've never felt lonelier. I'm sad, and I think I miss him. Parker knelt in front of me and held my knees. Mariah, you two are meant to be together. No amount of stubborn determination on your part is going to change that. Take it from me. I was in the same shoes once with Maxim. It isn't going to work. So, you're mates? Jamie raised her eyebrows when each of the shifters in the room stared at her in shock. What? Did you twits really think the rest of us had no clue about mates and shifters after living on this island? I know too. Ellen raised her hand and sighed. And I wish I had a mate. Parker looked at her curiously. This is stupid. I'm sorry I'm here, bawling like I'm peeling onions. I need to get back to work. I tried to get up, but they all put out hands to stop me. It was Aunt Kitty's hands on my shoulders that actually did the trick. I met her eyes in the mirror and bit my lip. Aunt Kitty, I have a boutique to focus on. She sighed and shook her head. From what I know of mates, they don't hinder your happiness, honey. If he's your mate, he's not going to be a problem to your business. You need someone at your side. You've been alone since I've known you. You showed up here when you were still a teen, independent, and refusing to let anyone get close. It took me a long time to break through some of those barriers and get you to trust that I'm on your side, always. I worry about you, and you're telling me that there's someone who wants nothing more than to care for you, stand beside you? What's wrong with that? I have a goal. I cannot, will not be distracted. They all looked at me like I was stupid. I need to go. I have more deliveries in my car. I want to drop off before I go back to the shop. Grand opening this weekend, guys. Don't forget to come by. I all but jumped out of the chair, removing the cape and brushing the hair trimmings off my neck while backing away. Sorry for being so insane. This grand opening has me a little crazy, but I'm good. I'm really good. Yes, I was aware I did not sound convincing at all. 
Mariah? I ignored Aunt Kitty and hurried out of the salon, running from their pitying eyes and dubious expressions. I felt even worse than I had when I'd arrived at the salon. I was 32 years old. I'd known what I wanted since I was 10. I'd worked my fingers to the bone to make it happen, and I was inches from achieving it. Yet, I had never felt so empty. Chapter 17, Patton I swept the last bit of sawdust into the dustpan and deposited it in the trash bin, then stepped back and admired the work I'd done. Instead of pride, I just felt numb. It didn't matter how great the shop looked, not when I was carrying around a big pit of nothingness where my heart used to be. I was well aware that I'd fallen into the mate trap, as it were, hence a whole lot of suffering. No amount of time spent out in the water on my boat with my guitar and cooler full of cold brews was going to fix this. My feelings were bouncing back and forth between being numb, being pissed at Mariah, being hurt, and feeling guilty about the way I'd treated her. I packed up my truck and was getting ready to lock her shop when her Honda Civic pulled into the lot. I heaved a sigh. I was the last person she wanted to see. I knew that when she'd left earlier, she'd done it to get away from me. She was undoubtedly hoping I'd be gone when she returned. Mariah had a lot on her mind with her big day, so I left the lights on for her. I planned to just leave quickly and without any fanfare, until my eyes took it upon themselves to glance her way. Her eyes were dewy and bloodshot. She'd been crying. Her posture was slightly slouched. She looked smaller, beaten down. Mariah, baby. She kept her eyes on the ground and blew out a rough breath. Hey, if someone fucking did something to her. Did something happen? Her lips stretched into a thin, tight line as she moved toward the door. No, nothing. See you tomorrow. I cleared my throat. You won't see me tomorrow, actually. Job's completed. Her head snapped up and she finally locked eyes with me. Wow. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks. I shoved my hands in my pockets and waited to see if she was going to say anything else. When she didn't, I frowned. That's it, I guess. She shrugged. I guess so. I took a couple of steps toward my truck, then turned around. Fuck. Mariah, you're really just fine with it being like this between us? Yes. She was lying, I could hear it in her voice, but why? I tried to keep my tone calm, but it was a struggle. So, this is goodbye. See you fucking never? She shrugged. If that's what you want. I walked across the lot and clasped her shoulders, leaning down and staring into her eyes. Let me be perfectly clear. It is not what I fucking want, not at all. She looked away. Her voice trembled, but did not sound hesitant. I have goals. They don't include. Backing away, I held up my hands. Got it, got it, good luck. I hope everything goes well. As hurt and angry as I was, I did mean that. I did hope her business venture would be a huge success. She deserved it. I walked to my truck and opened the door, only to slam it shut again and storm back toward her. I didn't know what I was doing, but I couldn't just leave like that. It doesn't have to be this way. It does, Patton. My anger turned to rage, boiling rage and searing pain, but I did my best to hold it in. Fine, well. I want you to watch your back. Don't lower your defenses. Finally, she showed some emotion, anger. What the hell's that supposed to mean? It means you're so busy focusing on your goals that you don't see you've got a wolf in the hen house. I growled and stopped myself from reaching for her again. Your boy, Johnny, I don't like how he looks at you. In fact, I don't like anything about him, and I don't trust him. If I can't be around to protect you, you need to keep your senses keen and your eyes open. Oh, so now I'm the helpless little woman who can't run her own business because it's too dangerous? You're judging him because he's a man who likes to look at women? You just described pretty much every straight man on the planet. Sounds more like you're the one with the problem. A petty jealousy problem. 
I could tell by her expression that she had no clue what I was talking about, but I meant it. I had an odd feeling about the guy. I'm just saying I don't like the way he looks at you, and since I won't be around, I want you to watch your back. What I really want is for you to fire his ass. If she wasn't pissed before, she was now. That really set her off. Listen, Mr. Jealousy, he works for me. Besides, he's on time every day. He stayed late twice, and so far, he's worked hard. Not everyone has the security of a family business to lean on. Not everyone can take a day off on a whim or show up at noon without getting fired. Or work a couple of hours, then slip away on their boat without a care about where their next paycheck is coming from. She stepped closer and scowled at me so hard she had creases in her face. How dare you think I can't hire the right people on my own or do what's right for my business? I shook my head at her insults. Got it. Then I held up my hands in surrender and backed away toward the truck. Neither of us said anything else as I opened the truck door and climbed in. I glanced once more at her and almost got back out of the truck when I saw tears streaming down her face. The thing that stopped me was that her forehead was wrinkled, her arms were wrapped tightly around herself, and she was staring daggers at me. She was a hard ass. She wanted to be comforted, but she wouldn't accept it if someone dared try. I slammed the truck door shut and started the engine. God, I wanted to get out and hold her, but she was so prickly I knew how well that would go over. I stared at her through the windshield, trying to decide what to do. Get out like a damn fool, only to have her spit venom and push me away, or just get the hell out of there and let her simmer down. I swore and shifted the truck into reverse before backing out with her still in my headlights, still glowering. I dialed Dylan as I drove. As soon as he answered, I barked orders at him. Grab what you need if you're coming with me on the boat. I'm headed out in an hour and I'm not coming back to town for a while, he swore. I have a face-to-face -face with a client tomorrow. I can't come, man. Fine. I hung up and tossed the phone across the truck. It was better that way anyway. I wanted to be alone and have some time to recover from the mind fuck that had been discovering my mate. Like he could sense my turmoil and wanted to make it worse, my big brother was waiting for me on the boat. He frowned when he spotted me. What's wrong, bro? I shoved past him. This boat is leaving as soon as I get the anchor up, and I'm not hitting shore for a couple of weeks, so there's your warning. Get off now or swim back later. Hey, man, talk to me. What happened? I spun around. My fucking mate, that's what. I'm not good enough for Miss High and Mighty. I have goals, and they don't include a lazy good-for-nothing like you. Did she say that? I'm paraphrasing. Jake's face fell. Oh, fuck, Patton, I'm sorry. That can't be right, though, man. I pointed a shaky finger toward the dock. I don't want to hear another word about it, not another word. You need to get the fuck off my boat, right now. He plopped himself into the deck chair, arms over his chest. I guess I'm going out to sea with you. Tilly's still in Washington for a few more days, and I don't have another job lined up until next week. I assume you finish the job for... Don't. Do not say her name right now. Do not fucking do it. I was barely holding on. It was all I could do to get into the control room and raise the anchor. I saw Jake untying the mooring lines, and the second he had the last one unhitched, I steered Castaway out of the slip and away from Sunkissed Harbor as fast as I could. I didn't know if I ever wanted to return to the island. Not one time had Mariah mentioned that I'd shown up at 9 a.m., every day for the past week, not because I needed to in order to complete the job as scheduled, but because it made her feel more secure. No, she just wanted to paint me in the worst possible light because it made her feel better about pushing me out of her life. Fuck if I was gonna play that little game of hers. But even as I thought it, my heart knew that if Mariah would only give just a little bit, just a little, I'd grovel at the woman's feet like a lovesick fool. Chapter 18, Mariah This place looks amazing. Emily's wide smile lit up her face as she looked around. 
I can't believe it came together so fast. It's really beautiful, Miss Mariah. I tried to see what she saw. I couldn't find it in me to be excited, no matter the fact that the grand opening of Bubbles was less than 24 hours away. I should be elated, but instead, I was mopey and glum. Still, I forced a smile, and if Emily saw through it, she didn't say anything. It does look good. She ran her hands over the shelving and straightened a few jars of sugar scrub. I'm in love with this new scent you worked on. I hate that we didn't have time to get the matching soaps cured. I know plenty of women will pay good money to give this to their men. I ran my hand over the scent I'd aptly named Grizzly. I'd become a masochist, clearly, and had worked for two nights straight to get the scent of Patton into oils, lotions, and shower gels. There was also a beard balm and shave cream. Hell, the scent was burned into my brain anyway. I figured there'd be no harm in putting it on the shelf. We'll be here first thing in the morning to help set up. I can't wait to see the cake that they'll drop off from the bakery. Emily gripped my hand and smiled. This is really happening. I feel like it's my grand opening too. I dragged my eyes away from Patton's scent. It is. It's a grand opening for all of us. I couldn't have gotten this far this fast without you and Cody. Cody strolled up and tossed his arm around my shoulder. We all know that's a lie, boss lady. You could have and you would have. You basically did. You hardly let us do anything. Emily grabbed Cody's hand and pulled him with her toward the door. That's a conversation for another day, though. I'm making Cody take me to the diner for milkshakes as a celebration. Are you sure you don't want to come along? I nodded and looked back at the shelf with the grisly products. They were going to be a constant torture. Thanks, but I'm going to go over everything one thousand more times. Cody laughed and shook his head. Take it easy. Go home and get a good night's sleep. Yes, Dad. They laughed and then took off down the sidewalk. They were young and Saturday night called to them. I was almost jealous. I didn't have a right to be. I'd made my own bed, and now I had to lie in it. In fact, I'd not only made it, I'd built my bed from the ground up by hand. So now, I had no one to blame but myself for the lumpy-as-hell mattress. I remained standing in the center of my completed boutique. It was all ready to receive its first customers. This was everything I'd wanted. Everything I'd spent so many years fighting for. It was beautiful, and I should feel ecstatic. Instead, I felt indifferent, and I knew why. The real question I was facing was, am I strong enough to do something about it? I could remedy the whole thing, have my cake and eat it too, as it were. What Aunt Kitty had said about mates not hindering happiness? Emily and Cody gone? I startled hard and jumped at the voice from behind me. Spinning fast, I let out a relieved exhale to find it was only Johnny. You scared the hell out of me. I thought you'd left. There was an odd look in his eyes that made me uneasy. I couldn't help remembering Patton's warning. It was probably my overactive imagination. I was letting Patton's ridiculous jealousy get to me. Yes, they just went out for milkshakes to celebrate. You could probably catch them if you tried. He looked down at his shoes and shoved his hands in his pockets. Nah, I don't think they care all that much for me. I frowned. Was there tension among my employees that I hadn't noticed? Had I been oblivious? What do you mean? They're just kind of snobs. My frown deepened. Snobs? That didn't sound like Cody or Emily. What was going on behind my back? Is there something going on between you three that I should be aware of? If my employees are having issues, I'd like to know. I'd prefer to nip that kind of thing in the bud before it escalates. He shook his head. I think Cody has a crush on you. He shrugged. He doesn't like a new guy being around. An uncomfortable feeling slithered up my spine. Cody is a child in my eyes. He's over 12 years my junior. I'm 32 years old, too old to be hanging out with any of you. 32's not too old. I flashed a quick smile and took a step back. That's nice of you to say, but that's relative. Not that it matters anyway. 
Cody doesn't have a crush on me. I'm his boss. Neither of us has crossed any lines or engaged in any sort of unprofessional behavior. Johnny scoffed. You don't notice how he looks at you? I'd had enough. Okay, Johnny, this conversation is over. It's been a long day, it'll be a long night, and tomorrow is a day I've been anticipating and dreaming about for over half my life. I'm sure whatever tension is happening between you and Cody is just the stress of the grand opening. He stepped closer. It's not. Why don't you go head home now? You should rest up. Hopefully we'll be swamped and I'll need every one of you to be at your best. I turned to walk away, but Johnny grabbed my arm and yanked me toward him a little too hard. Johnny? He slammed his lips over mine before I could jerk away from him. I leaped back a few feet, scowling. He frowned. Sorry, I must have misread your signals. He didn't look sorry. You sure as fuck did. That is never going to happen again or I will fire your ass so fast that your head will spin. Do you understand me? He looked down at his feet and nodded. I'm really sorry. He still didn't look sorry. I groaned and pulled my hands down my face. Okay, I'm willing to forget it, but only with your assurance that nothing like that will ever happen again. You ever heard of a thing called affirmative consent? No mixed signals. You wait until you hear a loud, clear yes with no confusion. You cannot just kiss a woman without their consent. And grabbing my arm, I wagged my finger at him. Uh-uh, you're lucky I didn't knock your balls up into your stomach. I get it. His voice said he didn't. I turned to walk toward the workroom to get away from him. I really didn't need to deal with this, too. Just go home. I heard the scuff of his sneaker on the wood laminate flooring right behind me. I was about to light into him, but before I could turn, a sharp, cracking pain bloomed across the base of my skull. I felt my eyes roll back and the floor rise to meet me as I floated into unconsciousness. I woke briefly a few times, still in a cloudy haze, while my body fought to heal itself. Whatever Johnny had hit me with had been heavy and hard. Each time I came to, my head throbbed so badly that my body mercifully let me drift back to the peaceful darkness. Through a haze, I heard something. I wasn't sure what. Sounds? Crashing? Swearing? Someone was angry and yelling at me? When I finally came to completely and the fog started to clear, I blinked and a massive headache throbbed at the back of my head. I pushed myself up to a sitting position and held my head in my hands. Reaching back, I felt dried blood caked in my hair and a large knot. Groaning, I pulled myself up and staggered a few steps before actually focusing on my surroundings. When what I was seeing registered, my heart stopped. Then it shattered into a million pieces. Pain and anguish racked my body, and I sank back to the ground. Covering my mouth to stop the hoarse cry that ripped free, I looked around at what used to be my beautiful boutique. It was destroyed. Everything was trashed. Products were littering the floor in a goopy mess. The shelves were damaged, and everything was covered in what looked like red spray paint. The words scrawled in paint were some of the filthiest I'd ever read. I stumbled to the register. It was open and empty. I turned in hectic circles, taking everything in again and again, my mind frantically trying to formulate a plan to fix it. Then I prayed it was a nightmare and I'd open my eyes again and see everything back to the way it had been. I even tried it. When it didn't work, I slumped back to the ground and cried. I cried until I didn't think I'd ever stop, and then I fought to get back on my feet and leave the shop. I shifted and took flight before I even knew where I was going. Even if he hated me, even if he never wanted to see me again, I needed to see Patton. Seeing Patton was the only thing that would help ease the pain, and I couldn't handle the excruciating agony. My entire body felt as though it had been split open and torn to shreds. Was there even a remote possibility that Patton wouldn't push me away? Chapter 19 
Patton. I was kicking back on the boat with Jake, scowling at the stupid sunset, every cell in my body aching for Mariah, when her scent hit. She was close by. Nah, that couldn't be. I'd anchored us far from shore to avoid having anything to do with her. I sniffed the air again. Her sweet, lemony scent was unmistakable. Then, I was assaulted by the sharp odor of pain, followed by the unmistakable coppery tang of blood. I was already up and half grisly by the time she landed. She elegantly perched on the side of the boat and shifted. She no sooner transformed into her human form than her wobbly legs gave out and she crumpled, falling into my arms, naked and weak. Mariah, fuck! I growled at Jake, who read my mind and scrambled to get something to put over her. I stretched her out on the lounge chair I'd just vacated. Talk to me, baby, what happened? She curled in on herself, crying loud, racking wails. Each one affected me as though my organs were being physically yanked from my body. I quickly examined her. The only injury I found was on the back of her head. There was a good deal of dried blood caked in her hair. When I worked my fingers through the mess, I felt a lump the size of a goose egg. I released a ferocious roar into the darkening sky. Jake came back with one of my shirts and turned away. What happened? I don't know. Come on, baby, talk to me. Tell me what happened. He... <laughs> He destroyed it. My shop, it's in ruins. She choked back more tears and let me pull the shirt over her. She uttered one more word that made my blood run cold. Johnny. I clenched my jaw tightly and worked to remain calm. He hurt you? I'll turn the boat around. Jake knew me well. Johnny was going to pay for whatever he did to her. He would be lucky if he didn't pay with his life. He... He kissed me, and I told him no. He apologized, but... She reached up and felt her head. He hit me with something when I turned. Oh, Patton, he destroyed the boutique. Everything. All the hard work you did. All the hard work I did. It's all in ruins. I was barely able to contain my seething bear, already on a warpath for vengeance. He won't get away with it. He cleaned out the cash register, everything I had in there, and the money I kept in the back in the office. I had extra on hand to pay the caterers tomorrow. He destroyed my dream, every bit of it. Her brown eyes met mine, and the depth of heartbreak in them pierced my soul like a dagger. I know I don't deserve it, and you probably don't want to. She sniffled and released another sob. But will you just hold me? I pulled her into my arms and held her tightly against my chest. The fuck you don't deserve it? I always want to hold you, baby, always. I rubbed her back as soothingly as I could in the agitated state I was in. How dare that piece of shit? How dare anyone think they could do this to her and get away with it? After a few minutes, I stood and scooped her into my arms and carried her inside. I looked over at Jake. Hear all that? He nodded and scowled. I'll have us back on the island before too long. Come and grab me when we dock. I carried Mariah down into the cabin, into my room, and sank onto the bed with her. Situating her carefully, I laid us both down with her on top of me, my arms tightly around her. Stroking her back, I found that I couldn't stop the low growl my bear was continuously emitting. He was fixing to scorch the earth in his wake to unleash the fury of hell on the fool who thought he could do this to our mate and get away with it. I'm so sorry, Patton. I'm sorry for all the harsh things I said. I don't deserve you. Her words were muffled, but I heard them. Stop that. I held her more tightly and reached down to pull the blanket up over her legs. I'm not going to listen to another apology. You'll heal soon and we can talk more after. For now, you're going to rest until you feel better. She was still crying, but it was slower. Everything's gone, Patton. It's all over. Not while I had any breath left in my lungs, it wasn't. I held her until she fell asleep, the knot on the back of her head already shrinking. With her shifter healing, she'd be okay. When Jake poked his head through the doorway, I was already gently slipping out from under her. 
Scooting around quickly, I found an old notepad half buried under my bed and scribbled out a note to let her know that I'd be back. I stared down at her for a minute, watching her gentle breathing before hurrying out of the room and off the boat. I already called some of the crew and offered overtime. They're going to meet us at the shop. We'll assess the damage and go from there. I couldn't speak as we drove to Bubbles' boutique. As soon as we pulled into the parking lot, I could already see the damage through the front window. Products were smashed, shelves were broken, glass display cases were shattered, and big smears of spray paint read words that I was going to carve into that motherfucker with my claws. Jake's eyes grew wide. Holy hell. I knew that piece of garbage was bad news, I knew it, and I left her here with him. From the way I hear it, she didn't give you much choice in the matter, brother. If you're gonna beat yourself up about it, do it later. We've got more important things to do first. He looked around and groaned. Mariah have any friends who wanna pitch in and help with this? I blinked and looked up at the ceiling as though it would help me find an answer. Friends? I didn't know. She was always alone. She had employees, the kids who worked in the shop. They seemed to be pretty devoted to her. I rubbed my chest and shook my head. I don't know. Well, I'll call Parker. She's the one who recommended us, she might know. He left and came back not even a full two minutes later. Parker's on her way and she's rounding up a few people to help. I nodded and scrubbed my face over my hands. I'm going to fucking kill him. What's his name? Johnny. I don't know his last name. We'll find him. Do you have his scent? I nodded. Fuck yeah, I do. We need to get this going first. Within 30 minutes, there were more people inside the store than I'd expected. I should have known my pretty bird would have a quiet following of people who loved her, no matter how hard she tried to keep everyone around her at arm's length. Parker's face was bright red and she fought tears as she hugged her mate, a guy I recognized as one of the polar bears who'd arrived on the island a while back. I can't believe someone would do this to her. This is just awful, her mate growled. Some people have no decency. He met my eyes. We'll take care of it. I shook my head pointedly. I'll take care of it. He stared at me for a second and then nodded. Understood. Where is she? An older woman with a brightly colored scarf tied around her head stormed up to me and grabbed the neck of my shirt, shaking it as she spoke. Where's my baby? She's tough on the outside, but this? She looked around and let out an anguished cry. This is going to kill her? I reached around and hugged the woman because she seemed to feel almost as distraught as I did. She's on my boat, sleeping. She doesn't know we're here. Is she okay? I looked around the crowd. Our crew had arrived and Parker had done what she'd said. There must have been 30 people, some rubbing sleep from their eyes, some wearing PJs, many toting brooms and mops and cleaning supplies. The two kids that worked for Mariah both had glazed eyes as they scanned the place, stunned and horrified. I cleared my throat and got the attention of the room. Mariah will be okay, physically. As you all know, she planned to launch the grand opening of this store tomorrow at 10 a.m. We're here tonight to make sure that happens. Got it? Jake hefted his tool bag. Got it, brother. Parker sniffled and lifted her bag of cleaning supplies. Damn right. Everyone stepped up. The natural leaders emerged and each put themselves in charge of something. An older woman with bright pink hair took on the role of overseer. They scrubbed, swept, painted, and organized the surplus products in the back. Mariah's two employees, Cody and Emily, chose which pre-made products would line the new shelves and display cases once our crew finished building them, then kicked everyone out of the workroom and set about mixing and formulating extra products. As soon as I was sure that Jake and the crew had a concrete plan and could be finished in time to get the bath and body care products displayed before morning, I slipped out to hunt down the dead man who thought he could hurt Mariah, crush her dream, and get away with it. I found Johnny hanging out with a crowd of young guys all around his age in their early 20s. They were standing outside of Cap and Jim's, laughing and smoking. The moron didn't even know enough to lay low after committing a crime. The bouncer took one look at me and discreetly slipped inside. Johnny had his back to me, but as I neared, his buddies saw me. Eyes widened, jaws dropped, 
Legs pumped, feet ran. Johnny never saw me coming. By the time he turned around to question what had scared his friends off, he was face to face with one massive, pissed as fuck grizzly. He screamed as I took a swipe at him with my paw and knocked him into the side of the building. Bricks cracked and chipped from the force. The sack of shit slumped on the ground, groaning and cradling his head. I wrestled control from my bear, who would have, at that second, ended the shitbag's life. Instead, I kicked him in the ribs. You hurt my woman! Shrieking and yelping, Johnny looked up at me, protecting his face with his arms and trying to scramble away. I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. You can have the money back. I'm sorry. When I picked him up by the front of his shirt like he weighed nothing, I could see his fear multiply. If you show your face anywhere near this island again, I will not hesitate to tear it off and eat it. It would be as simple as taking a shit for me to drag a claw across your soft, scrawny throat and watch you bleed out. And no one would dare say a thing about it. Do you fucking understand me? Johnny pissed himself. He reeked of fear, and although he didn't deserve my mercy, I knew Mariah would be disappointed with me if I gave in to temptation and ended the coward. When I dropped him, he slumped to the ground but managed to reach into his pocket and toss a wad of cash at me. You'll never see me again, I swear. I'll be watching you, fucker. If you ever pull anything like this again, if you so much as think about it, I will slice you down the middle and watch your intestines puddle on the ground. Remember that. I shifted into my bear in front of him and snapped my sharp fangs an inch from his face before lumbering off into the night. When I returned to Mariah's shop, I was shaking from the intense fury still coursing through me. It had taken a lot for me not to rip that asshole apart. He was young, maybe the threat I just gave him would serve as a lesson and scare him straight, but I was still enraged by what he'd done. He hadn't just hurt her physically. He could have knocked her out and stolen the money, but he also chose to destroy what he knew was precious to her. I leaned against the side of the building and fought the urge to go back, hunt him down, and squeeze the breath out of the low-life scum. My rage was swirling around me in waves of fury. I wasn't sure I could contain it. I wasn't sure I wouldn't give in, go back, and finish Johnny off. Dylan's voice broke through my haze. Breathe, Patton. You've got to breathe, man. I snarled at him. Fucking get away from me. I'm not leaving you like this. Breathe, fucker. He came even closer. Your mate is okay. She's safe in your bed where she's meant to be. Nothing is going to happen to her. I should have killed him. I should go back. He doesn't get to hurt her and live. When I straightened, Dylan pushed my shoulders back against the cinder block. No. I know you well enough to know that you did what you had to do. I also know you're not a murderer, not unless you're given no other choice. I'm a grizzly. A peaceful one. What the fuck are you doing here anyway? Jake called? What? You don't think I want to come down and help? Jake's call did interrupt some hot and heavy bed play. I snorted, feeling a little calmer. Uh, with which one, Brittany or Ashley? Both. I rolled my eyes and found myself laughing despite my still simmering anger. He draped his arm across my shoulders and faked a jab to my rib cage like he'd done when we were kids. I never thought I'd see the day when Pat and James willingly surrendered to matehood. Caring about someone else more than you care about yourself. That's new for you. Fuck you. He chuckled, then faced me. His expression took on a more serious aspect. I'm happy for you, man. It looks good on you. He clapped me on the back as we turned to head into the boutique. I hope it gets easier on you, though, once you claim her and make her yours. She's already mine. I snarled the words at him, only to find him grinning back at me. Chapter 20 Mariah Coming awake slowly, enveloped in Patton's scent, I stretched and winced when the throbbing pain at the back of my head caused my memories to resurface. I looked around for him, but the boat was too quiet, too empty, so I reached out with my mind, trying to detect Patton's energy. I got nothing. 
He wasn't nearby. Sitting up, I found a note on the table next to the bed and read through the scrawl twice before the word sank in. He'd gone to the shop to see if he could clean up and make repairs. The image of my boutique as I'd last seen it flashed through my mind along with searing pain and heartache. Obviously, Patton didn't realize that I hadn't been exaggerating my claims when I told him it was ruined. It would take weeks for me to clean up the mess and reformulate products, and probably longer to repair the smashed structures. I didn't even want to think about it, much less face it and get started. Still, I wasn't one to hide from my problems. The best thing to do was to pull what little money I had left from my savings and use that to pay the caterers. I'd bury the anguish and greet every customer with complimentary food and an apology. It was the least I could do to improve the situation and take it from horrific to merely dreadful, if that could be called improvement. If I handled the situation well enough, maybe customers would return once repairs were completed and the boutique was ready to reopen, if the boutique ever reopened. I wasn't sure I was motivated anymore, not after this. Plus, this time, I'd need to apply for a loan. And now I had Patton to think about. My heart bounced around in my chest over the fact that Patton had tried to help. I had to talk to him. He'd come through for me. He'd been awesome when I needed him, and he'd held me while I cried. That was more than I'd ever let anyone else do for me, and he'd done it perfectly. Shifting, I flew home and took a fast shower to get the dried blood out of my hair. Then I dressed in a bright sundress that didn't fit my mood at all, but I figured maybe the cheerful color would rub off some. As the sun was rising, I walked to the shop. I walked slowly. Yes, I knew I needed to feel the customers and do damage control as best I could, but I wasn't looking forward to it. The closer I got, the sicker the heavy feeling in the pit of my stomach made me. This should have been the happiest day of the last thirty years, the pinnacle of my achievements, but... I heard them before I could see them. A crowd of people was already standing around the sidewalk in front of the boutique, eating donuts and drinking coffee from little throwaway cups. My stomach plummeted. It was too late for damage control. Everything was already imploding. She's here! Parker came running from the center of the group. She had her baby on one hip, but that didn't stop her from throwing herself at me. She wrapped me in a one-armed hug, checked my head, and then blinked away tears. We have all been so worried about you. All? Before I could ask who all was, I was pulled away from her. I found myself being squeezed so hard I was almost smothered by Aunt Kitty. What? Aunt Kitty, what are you doing here? Jammy, wearing leopard print pajamas, came up and wrapped her arms around the both of us. That's when I took another look at the crowd. They weren't just a crowd of customers. They were all people I knew well. What the hell was... Aunt Kitty ran her hands over my head, my face, and just about everywhere else. Are you okay? I don't know what I'd do if anything happened to you, honey. You scared ten years off my life. October propped up and grinned. She really can't afford that kind of damage to the years she's got left? Aunt Kitty wiped tears from her eyes and swatted October. Oh, shut up, girl, or I'll turn you over my knee and whip your behind. Megan, cradling her infant son, hugged me next. I'm so sorry such an awful thing happened to you, Mariah. Don't you worry. You have the lease, no matter what. If we need to work something out payment-wise while you get back on your feet, that's fine. I have absolute faith in you. On and on it went. I was passed down a line of people, each of them saying encouragingly positive things to me. I was too shocked to form words. People I didn't think cared one iota about me were here, standing on the sidewalk, two hours before the boutique had even been expected to open for the first time. Many were in what looked like night clothes. What the hell was going on? When I finally got through the crowd, I found Patton. 
He was standing next to his brother, Jake. Patton looked tired, and the strain around his eyes tugged at my heartstrings. But there was a warm smile on his handsome face. He held out his hand for me, and I took it. I was grateful for him, more now than ever. He was what was keeping me grounded. All your friends volunteered to help you get your boutique back in order. What? He held my shoulders as he steered me toward the shop, and he kept holding me, turning me around to see everything. My eyes bugged out of my head. I blinked a couple of times. The shop was put back together. It was exactly as it had been. One of the porcelain sample testing sinks had been smashed, so now there was only one. The shelving units were a little more basic and lacked all the intricate details Patton had added to the carpentry. My products were displayed slightly differently than I'd originally had them, but as a whole, it looked wonderful. Absolutely beautiful. I inspected everything more closely. All traces of the spray paint had been scrubbed clean. The glass in the display cases had been replaced. The floors were spick and span, and there was even a couple of my scented candles burning on the sales counter, giving off a lovely aroma of lemon zest. I glanced up at Patton, struggling for words. He'd not only comforted me at my darkest hour, he'd worked his ass off to fix it and make this day right for me. I opened my mouth to utter a thank you, but instead burst into tears. Patton pulled me into his arms, and I buried my face against his chest while he stroked my back. I wasn't one to publicly display emotions, and Patton knew that. I was embarrassed to be bawling in front of practically everyone I knew. Excuse us a second, folks. Uh, we'll be right back. Patton scooped me up like I weighed nothing and carried me to the back room. Shutting us in, he sat me on my desk and stood between my thighs. He held my chin in his palm, his eyes staring into mine. You're not giving up on this place. I won't let you. Those people out there were here all night, working their butts off, and for no other reason than they care about you. You're not alone, babe. There's a whole army out there that loves you and is rooting for you. You see that, right? I sniffled, cupped his face between my hands and nodded. Not alone at all. He wiped my eyes with the pad of his thumb and smiled. Now get your CEO shoes on, woman. You've got a big grand opening to host. The caterers will be here in an hour, and if I know you like I think I do, you'll need to go over every detail three more times to make sure it's perfect before you actually open. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to thank you or how to thank them. I couldn't stop the gentle flow of tears. You don't have to thank me. You know why I did this. The look in his eyes told me what his mouth wasn't quite able to say yet or maybe what he was worried my ears weren't ready to hear yet. You can thank them by going out there and being you. Shine brightly like you always do. You worked your ass off for this. Today's your day. I laughed and nodded. Okay, <laughs> I can do that. Yeah, you sure can. Go make it happen. I stood up, suddenly feeling awkward. There was so much else I needed to say to him. Like he could read my mind, he shook his head and pointed toward the shop floor. Go, revel in this day you've created. You and I can talk later. I'm not going anywhere. I finally nodded and took a step toward the door. I kept looking back at him as I left, wondering when and how I should make this up to him. A second later, I was on the shop floor, surrounded by a crowd of people, friends, all asking what else they could do to help. It was then that I was struck with a profound realization. While I was proud of my accomplishments, rising from poverty, having a successful business, and now a brick-and-mortar place to sell my products, what mattered even more was this, these people around me. It warmed my heart to know that all these people cared about me. Today was so much more than my boutique's opening day. Today I learned that, as Patton said, I had an army behind me. I'd been so busy pushing people away and never noticed. Patton and everyone around me had made a miracle happen. 
A wide smile spread across my face as I ran around reorganizing some of the soaps and bath salts just the way I wanted them. My eyes found Patton every so often, watching me and smiling. Each time I was tempted to drop what I was doing and go to him, but each time he just winked and looked away, talking to whoever was beside him. Time flew by, and the next thing I knew, the caterers had arrived and were setting up. I opened my purse to pull out my checkbook, but they informed me that they'd already been paid. I looked around but couldn't find Patton. I had a feeling he was responsible for that, too. Food was set up. The cake was displayed. Cody and Emily had returned and were almost boasting as they showed customers our products. They talked about the products with genuine pride. I worked the register, not really surprised to find that the cash that had been missing was now back. The entire day ran as smoothly as I'd always hoped. People shopped, they tested products, asked questions, seemed impressed with my creations, and made purchases. A lot of purchases. Between customers, I looked for Patton. I still wanted desperately to talk to him. I wanted to tell him that I'd been wrong. I'd been so focused on my goals that I'd sacrificed what was most important. Meaningful relationships. When I couldn't spot him anywhere, I began to feel a little panic start to rise in my chest. I slipped into my office and dialed his number. You're supposed to be busy working right now, woman, he answered gruffly. I didn't stay up all night just so you could slack off. I smiled. Don't call me woman. What am I supposed to call you then? Well, if I didn't mess things up too royally, you could call me mate. He growled. Not over the phone, woman. Things are slowing. We could talk. You're running a business. Go run it. Find me after. I sighed. It's harder than I thought it would be. Running the boutique? Staying here, focusing on what I thought was the most important thing to me, then finding out what I really want most is to come find you and show you how sorry I am. Another low growl. I'm waiting for you. Find me as soon as you're finished. I slipped my phone into my pocket after we hung up and, still smiling, went back out to greet more customers. I felt a little lighter, and it was easier to focus after his invitation to find him later. Before I knew it, it was closing time. Cody checked out the last few customers while Emily and I restocked the shelves and cleaned up. By the time it was just the three of us in the shop, I was smiling from ear to ear at the tremendous success of the day. That was the most amazing grand opening in the history of grand openings. Emily leaned against the front counter and sighed. All those friends of yours really came through. It makes me want to cry. Of course they came through for her. Why wouldn't they? Boss lady is awesome. I noticed Cody scooted a little closer to Emily than he normally would have. I wondered if maybe something was going on between those two. Emily was right on the mark. I was still a little in shock. I'd seen Layla, Megan, Margie, even Ellen, the new front desk girl at Jammies, and a bunch of big guys who must have been mates of some of the women. Most of the women and some of the men had come back and shopped too. And there was Patton. Mariah? Emily grinned. What are you thinking about? I brushed my hair out of my face and shrugged. Nothing. Uh-huh. Is nothing about six foot five with sandy blonde hair, big hulking muscles, and a goofy grin? She laughed when my eyes widened. What? How could you not be thinking about him? He was the one who organized all the cleanup and rebuilding. That man really came through for you. He did you right. He also took care of Johnny, if the gossip going around is true. Yeah, that asshole won't be showing up around here ever again. I grabbed my purse and pointed them toward the door. Time to lock up. Thank you both for all you did today. And I will see you tomorrow. I've got to go and thank Patton. Cody snorted. I'm sure you do. Emily chased him out of the shop, pushing him and calling him a pervert, while I closed up and locked everything, grinning like a fool. No, 
not like a fool, like a very happy woman. Chapter 21, Patton I was lounging on the deck of Castaway when Mariah climbed aboard. She'd showered and changed into a teeny tiny slip of a dress. It was quite obvious she didn't have a bra or panties underneath. She slipped out of her heels and dropped them before walking over and standing in front of me. I'm sorry, I was wrong. I thought I couldn't have both a mate and my boutique, but the only reason I still have my boutique is because of my mate. I'm sorry I pushed you away. Last Sunday was the best day of my life, and I had more fun than I can ever remember having, because of you. I'm not great at balancing things. It's always been all or nothing for me. When I focus on something, I give it my entire focus. Maybe you could help with that. I stared up at her and blinked. She was going to kill me. Before I could say anything, she continued. At the shop today, I realized my dream has grown. It looks different. Now you're in it. I don't know exactly how to pull that off, but I know that I want to try. I caught her hand and pulled her down into my lap. Maybe start with taking two days off a week. Two days where it's just the two of us, maybe on the boat, every week. She bit her lip and then nodded. It can't be the typical weekend, but I'm planning to hire a new manager, one who is nothing like, ugh, I'm not even going to say his name. In the meantime, I think Cody and Emily can handle the shop on their own on Mondays and Tuesdays. They really stepped up. They were awesome today. I growled and buried my face in her neck. She giggled. I take it I don't need to file a police report. Did you hurt him badly? Not nearly as badly as I wanted to, or as much as he deserved. I sat back so I could look her in the eyes. He's gone, and I scared the piss out of him, literally. I don't think he'll be doing anything like that again to anyone anytime soon. If he does, I will kill him. I wanted to last night after he hurt you. She cupped my face. You saved me. This whole mate thing was kind of sprung on me, on both of us. I wasn't ready for it. Now that I've gotten to know you, I can't let go. I kissed her, then tasted the sweet lemony flavor that was my Mariah. You are mine, Mariah Star. And you are mine, Patton James. I wasn't ready for the mate thing either. She blinked away tears and chewed on her lip. I am now. I heard her breath hitch as I leaned forward and planted a kiss on the swell of her breast. I slid her over so she was straddling me. Her dress slid up and I gripped her thighs, peppering kisses from her collarbone to her throat. I want to claim you with my mark. I don't know how parrots do it, but I need to sink my teeth into you and make you mine. My woman. She rocked her hips against mine. Do it. I want you to. I was lost then. I stood and carried her down into the cabin. Before we reached the bed, I had her pinned against the door and was kissing her. Long and heated kisses left us both gasping for air. I couldn't get enough of her. I kissed her again, gripping her ass in one hand and her hair in the other. When she sucked my tongue into her mouth, my hips bucked into hers, dragging moans from both of us. I turned and with her legs still wrapped around me, walked her farther into the boat, cursing when I hit my knee on the coffee table. Stumbling forward, I barely caught us before I slammed her into the door to my room. Unfazed, she laughed and bit my lip. I tossed her onto the bed and stared down at her wickedly. I was such a fucking idiot to think I could walk away from you. She moved to her knees and gave a teasing smile back before pulling her dress over her head. Completely bare, she bit her lip. I was right there, too. Maybe that's why fate put us together. Because we're both stubborn and dumb? She laughed again and nodded. Come here. I shoved my shorts down and kicked them off before closing the distance between us. Kissing down her neck, I teased the skin across her shoulder and then took her breasts into my hands. Running my thumbs over her nipples, I bent down to suck one between my lips. Biting and sucking, I ran my hand down her stomach and cupped her sex. 
when she rocked her hips against my hand and moaned my name, I swirled my fingers, taking her to a fast orgasm. It wasn't enough. I pushed her back on the bed and buried my face between her thighs, devouring her. I brought her to two more orgasms before I couldn't wait another second to sink into her. Mariah had another idea, though. She shoved my shoulders until I rolled over and then climbed on top of me. Her eyes were burning bright as she trailed kisses down my chest. I swore viciously and dug my fingers into the bedding as she took my dick into her hand and then lowered her mouth over me. Her swirling tongue nearly killed me. Her mouth worked magic, and in seconds I was so close to coming that it was embarrassing. I pulled her off me and flipped us so I was on top, the head of my cock right at her entrance. She raked her nails down my back and arched her hips into me. She was fucking with me, egging me on. I lowered my mouth, gently bit her shoulder, and like the animal I was, I surged into her in one hard thrust. I kissed her, tasted the mingling of both our scents on her tongue, and I growled into her mouth before pulling out and thrusting back in. Mariah dug her nails into my shoulders and held on as I pumped hard and fast. We were both desperate, so close to the edge already. She worked her hips under me, fighting to give as good as she was getting. Her cries of pleasure fueled me and I was a lost man. At that moment, I existed only to please her. Harder, faster, it was a battle to see who could make who come first. Like launching into space, the buildup was spectacular. Her kisses slowed, her mouth fell open, issuing my name as a broken cry from her lips. Her core tightened and pulsed around me as her orgasm hit hard. It sent me spiraling into my own, my body tightening before releasing into her. With one hand tangled in her hair, I pulled her head to the side and held her gaze for a moment, then lowered my mouth and sank my teeth into her neck. Fire coursed through my body, pleasure chasing it. She screamed, her body pulsating almost painfully around my shaft, until we'd sucked every last drop of pleasure from each other. I collapsed on top of her and growled into her neck, lazily running my tongue over the mark that would bond us together for the rest of our lives. That mark would never go away. She was really mine now, officially. Mariah finally tapped my shoulder and wiggled to get me off her. You're crushing my ribs. I chuckled and rolled off, pulling her into my side as I went. I held her beautiful body against mine and idly ran my fingers up and down her arm, unwilling to stop touching her. I liked it. I pulled her on top of me and grinned up at her. The crushing or the claiming? Both? I squeezed her ass and heard the softest purr come from her lips. I don't know to whom I need to write, but I need to personally thank fate for sending me a woman who will jump into wild sex with both feet. Are you calling me easy? Ha! <laughs> you think you were easy? Let me tell you, woman, you were anything but easy. She rolled her eyes, but her smile remained. Resting her chin on my chest, she watched me inside. I missed you this afternoon, I laughed. You barely like me, no way did you miss me. Biting her lip, she shrugged. I did, it wasn't the same in the shop without you. I hear you need another employee. Are you trying to poach me from James Construction? She barked out a laugh. Not a fucking chance, I'd kill you if you worked for me. What the hell is that supposed to mean? It means that while I love you and how you balance me and all, you're a free spirit. You would stress me into an early grave in the shop. I probably should have been offended, but I couldn't get past one word. You love me? She inhaled sharply and looked away. What? I didn't say that. Can't take it back now, woman. I slapped her ass playfully and laughed when she growled her little purring growl at me. You love my free spirit, you love me. What a softy you turned out to be. She nipped at my chest and sank her teeth in lightly, then let out a wild giggle when I rolled us over and bared my teeth at her. 
Her smile was bright and her eyes even brighter as she stroked her finger over my face. I guess I am a softy, but only with you. Damn, this woman was incredible. My heart was full to bursting with joy. I love you too, pretty bird. The End Thank you for listening. This has been Changed Mate, Cybermate Series Book 4. Written by Candace Ayers. Narrated by Maeve York. Copyright 2020 by Love Struck Romance. Stay tuned for Book 5, Chosen Mate, A Lion Shifter Romance.